We're starting the recording. Uh, we're live. So welcome everybody to today's episode of Profound States. Today we have Dr. Melanie Barton Bragg uh, with us. She has a master's degree in social work and a doctorate in post pastoral counseling and community development. She has maintained a private holistic Holistic psycho Psychotherapy Practice since eight, 1985 is an ordained uh, Disciples of Christ Christian Church Minister with ecclesiastical endorsement, whatever that is, uh, as a pastoral counselor. She is uh, a Reiki and Rife practitioner. She has taught at the college level, led multiple workshops, consulted with organizations and churches to navigate through transitions including educating them about sexual addiction. Uh, as a trained crisis responder, she is called in for debriefing, oh, hold on, debriefing critical incidences in private and governmental agencies. She works with extraterrestrial experiencers, helping them understand the reason and purpose for the contact with these beings. She helps remove ne negative negativity from people and dwellings. Her archived episode, the, the archived episodes of her internet radio show are, are available for listening on her website, which is www.thedrmelanieshow or melanieshow.com. That's T H E D R M E L A N I E S H O W.com. She has been interviewed on television, radio, and online live events, and she has written five books, which I'm not going to read here. Uh, her latest book is about school violence and how restorative justice helped heal the community. Uh, to contact her to lead a workshop, seminar, webinar, or teleconference, or to become a virtual client, you can reach her at Barton at gmail.com. That's D-R-M-E-L-A-N-I-E-B-A-R-T-O-N at gmail.com. And our books are available on Amazon. Welcome, Dr. Bart. Thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, how is your Sunday going so far? Nice and calm and relaxing so far. You said you meditated. What, what, uh, what do you... If you don't mind sharing, what exactly do you do for meditation? Back in 1976, when I was taking classes in a seminary, one of my professors was a Catholic sister. And she taught us how to meditate. And she taught us a number of things as a spiritual discipline. And she taught us many different methods. So starting back in 1976, is when I would get quiet and I would just try to push away the world and go inside. And sometimes when I meditate, I'm focusing on a word. So that's mindfulness meditation. So I might be just repeating the words peace, peace, peace over and over again. I might do a counting. If I'm distracted by a lot of things going on around me and can't quiet my mind, I'll count one, two, three, four or I'll just breathe into the count of four, hold for four and breathe out for the count of four so that I have a focus other than the crazy monkey brain that's going on. Sometimes when I meditate, I am connecting with people on the other side who have transitioned. Sometimes I'm connecting with historical figures on the other side. Sometimes I'm connecting with a council that I am working with that's an intergalactic council called the Council of Eight. So it depends on my purpose in meditating as to what method I use and what purpose I'm doing it for. So if if um, if somebody starts connecting with you when you're in meditation, how do you how do you uh, how do you experience them connecting with you? Uh, pretend that you know, let's say uh, you want to put the, the listener into your head and have them experience what you experience as 
somebody or something is connecting to you, what what exact how do you experience that? What I do with my clients and those who are people that want to learn how to do what I do, I take them first to a quiet inward place and we do a protective divine light infused with love around us. Then I have them breathe in through their nose, out through their mouth and do that three times. And then I verbally direct them to go inside to the place where they do their daydreaming, problem solving, meditating and praying. And in that place, depending on what we're trying to achieve, I will either then take them into another dimension. There's a, a launching pad that I have to raise their vibra vibration to take them to a higher plane. Or if there's something I want them to connect with a person like their inner child, then they will see on a screen or I'll instruct them to see a room and they can observe their inner child in that room and interact with the child. If I'm trying to do the law of attraction with people, then I'll get them to see on the screen the goal that they have written down and we've done a process to get to and I have them see it as if it were already accomplished on the screen. If it's to connect to a person on the other side, when I lead them through that landing pad and into that other dimension, then I will ask for that, that person we're trying to connect with to come like to a window. Like for us years ago, we watched the program laugh in. You remember yeah. that? Okay. And there would be different windows where people would peek their head out and say something funny. Sure. Sure. Well, when I'm connecting with people on the other side, sometimes I'll say, I would like so-and-so to come to the window. And then I tell the person that I'm leading in the meditation, just tell me what you hear or what you say or what emotion you get, or some image you get, or an object you get, and don't try to filter it, just tell me what you get. And then I'll write it down and we process it. And then sometimes I will get a loud pitch squeal in my right ear. And that's telling me that someone or something is trying to connect with me. It's like a phone ringing, but it's a high pitch squeal. And then I'll but, just kind of- But like, it's only in one ear. For me, it's in the right ear, yes. So you don't get it in both ears? No, just okay. in the right ear. And how long does it take to get your client in the state where they're receptive to people from the other side? It depends on how long I've been working with them and what their belief system is. So if they already come in open to the idea, it's a lot faster. It might take us um, two or three sessions to be able to get to that place where I teach them how to do it and then they can do it on their own. For other people who are reluctant or afraid, then we may have me go in while we're having a meditation time and, and I will ask the question. And so when I'm working with a client, those that are open to it, I will go into like a meditative state before the session begins. And I will say, if there's anyone or anything that has a message for this person, please tell me what it is so that I will discern. I'm the person that makes the decision whether it's appropriate to tell that person or not because sometimes they aren't ready to hear that it's too early and the person on the other side oh they need to know they need to know and i'll go yes but not today oh you mean like somebody who's just passed and they, yes. the person on the other side wants to give them a message really quick but they're not you don't think they're ready for it so an example i can give you the other day someone came through i was doing a grief recovery group with my clients and one of the spouses came through one of the people in the group and he was all excited. And he says to me, tell her it's tantamount for the tartan, for the tartan. And I'm going, I, I have no idea what this means, but because she was open to it, I said, this is what your husband's telling me. I have no idea. She said, well, I don't know either, but she learned to write it down. And she went afterwards and researched it. That tartan that I saw was the family tartan from Scotland. And there was no way that I would have known that. What's a tartan? A tartan is a design. It's like a plaid, but every clan, Scottish clan, has their own tartan, their own design. And this was that design of that person's last name from Scotland. Now, why I was to give that to the person, I have no idea. But I remind them, I'm just the messenger. So is a tartan like a moniker or a... Like it, it would be like a, a plaid like a plaid kilt. It's different kinds of plaid. The oh, you're talking about a cloth, something for cloth. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so it's something they would wear on their clothes. Something they would wear, yes. Okay, so. Um, all right, so where do we go? Um, so what level of Reiki are you? For one, two, or three? Two. Okay, and can you easily and simply explain the difference between the three levels of Reiki? From my experience of being trained in it, the level three, the, the group that went on to level three learned shamanic practices. And I didn't feel that that was the direction where I wanted to go. Level two that I do, not only can I do Reiki on myself, but I can also do it on clients. And level one, my understanding was you get the attunement, get the hands laid on you so you can do it, but you can't really have clients. You can kind of do it on yourself or with other people who are Reiki also trained, but not lay your hands professionally. On. And how many different types of Reiki are you familiar with? I am not familiar with different types. I only know the type that I was taught. So I'm sure there are many more, but I'm not aware of the others. Well, what, are the, what, what is your type called? It, all I was told it was Reiki. I wasn't told it's Dr. Asui. That yeah, I, well, OK, so we are, most people who, I guess I shouldn't say most people. A lot of people who have heard of Reiki have heard of Dr. Asui, but you, I've heard that there are other types too, so that's why I asked the question because uh, I figured it might not be. Uh, from him, but okay, so let's move on. So what is, uh, how do you do Rife work? Rife is a machine. It's a plasma bulb. Right. And it has hertz frequencies in it. Okay, so do you, hold on, stop. So do you have your Rife machine anywhere near you at this moment? Yes, I do. Can you show yeah. it on the screen? Can you show it on the screen? I don't think so. I don't know how I would do without that. Without moving, without moving the camera. You can't move the. Is it like a big machine or a small one? It is small. It it has it's a box, and then I have a computer connected to it, and then there there is a stand up bulb that's like a flashing light, and then there's a spiral one you hold in your hand and you put that near your spleen, and then there's one that you hold at nighttime while you're sleeping and lay it beside you. So how many how many plasma tubes do you have that are connected to your Rife machine? Um, one, two, three, three. Really? Not, they aren't all used at the same time. Yeah. Right, right. I understand. But is the one of them big and the others are small or how does it? Yes, yes. One would be shaped. Well, I can bring it and show you. Can I go get it and show it to you? You can do anything you want. Okay, I'm going to get it from you. Can you see okay. it? Yeah, I can. So that's the that's, that's the smart the, bulb. Okay. And that's the one that you it's plugged in to the machine. You see the yeah, those are yeah, okay. Okay, so that one. Okay, you gotta watch you, so you don't break that thing. It looks very yes. Delicate. Yes, it is fragile. And then this is the one, it's the hammer bulb that you would use at nighttime. So for longer periods. Why do you call it? Hold on, put it back in. Pull it back a little bit. Pull it back. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Uh, you can barely see it. Okay, that's good. Thank you. So what do you? Why do you call it a hammer bulb? That's just the name that the company that makes it calls it. Okay, so which company did you buy it from? True Rife. True Rife. And why did you pick? their rife machine as opposed to anybody else's because one with theirs you could do it on a card you know you could do it like you could put it on your credit card and pay your credit card over time right other companies you had to pay it all up front at once and i didn't have it all up front at once so you couldn't put the whole thing on your credit card all at once for the other company? if you had enough room on it you could oh i, I see what you're saying yeah. so you 
they are taking payment. They when you bought it, they took payments from you. Well, uh, what I did when I bought it is I put it on two different cards. Right. I didn't have room enough on one card. So I put it on two cards and then I paid off the cards. So that's the only reason you chose them because they had a better payment. Well, no, my friend that introduced me to Rife, she has a GB 5000, I think is what it's called. Yeah, and go ahead. With hers, you can dial in the frequency you want. You look in a book and you choose the frequency and dial it in. With mine, you don't dial in a frequency. You go to a set frequency so that I go look on the screen on the program and I pick out whatever the problem is and then I dial that in. you know I click on that and then it tells me which bulb to use how long to do it where to place the bulb whether you have the grounding mat behind you or under your feet or not at all so it's uh hers is has more uh flexibility but yours is easier to use right right yes but mine takes longer hers with the frequencies it can be very quick it's very it pulses. It's it's it can be a variety of of different things pulsing, but it's shorter time frame. Mine takes longer, but it's more direct. So, do you know the brand that she owns? I think it's a GB five thousand. I'd have to look. That's so. That's the model, but I mean the company. Right. That's the comp That's I think the company. That, I'd have to look it up to tell. Well, you. that's fine. If you don't know the uh, brand or the company name, that's fine. Uh, so you were taught at the college level, master's in social work. What college did you go to? The College of Social Work at Columbia, South Carolina. And um, looking back on your education, I had a hypnotherapy teacher uh, teach me. He was he got like a like a master's in hypnosis at, in Louis, somewhere in Louisiana, and. He, he made the statement, he's never used a single thing he learned in college hypnosis, ever, not one thing. And I thought that was kind of an interesting statement to make. But uh, do you, is it all done? No. All right. Somehow she turned on my flashlight on there. I've never learned how to turn the flashlight on, how she did it. Uh, anyway. My wife was talking to our bank and uh, about some fraudulent charges on her account. Anyway, uh, back to you. Uh, if you looked back on your college, do you? How much is there any of your college training that you actually use on the job? Anything at all? Yes, I use things every day. Seriously? Yes, I do. Okay. In your psychology practice? Yes. Okay. Um, so it was useful. It wasn't just for the paper. Correct. Okay, so um, you're a trained crisis responder. Of all the crises you've uh, come involved in, is there one that stands out that you'll never? If, let's say you got old and you got senile and had Alzheimer's. There's a one crisis. It stands out above all the others because it was more exciting or more anything. It just stands out. Is there, is there a crisis you've been involved in that was like that that you can mention? There was a case, um, a state worker who she was the matriarch of the office. There was a party. She planned it. If there was a death, she when you when you say state worker, you mean South Carolina? No, I'm in Florida. OK, Florida state worker. OK, go ahead. Go ahead with your story. Go ahead. With your OK, story. that's fine. So I'm called in when there's a sudden death and it's disruptive or there's been a murder or there's been, you know, some tragedy, a fire, um, a building collapse, something like that. I'm called in to help those who are the ones that either were the witnesses or the victims or the ones that have gone through whatever happened. And so I was called in to work in this situation and because she had been the matriarch. She had been the one that would have handled all of this. They were totally lost. They had no idea what to do. And so I had to teach them how other people had to take on the roles that she had left. And that I recommended that they declare a code word 
and the code word was blue, meaning that when they were thinking about her and it was causing them to not be able to keep on track of their work, all they had to say to somebody was blue. And that person who had been in that training with me knew, ah, and they might mean that they wanted a hug. It might mean that they needed to go cry. It might need a cup of coffee or might need to just talk. So it reframed who did what and restructured that office because of that event. So you were called in as a social worker for the crisis, is that? Okay. Yeah. But I've been uh, called in, I was called in after, I don't know if you remember the yoga shooting that happened at the hot yoga here a few years ago. Uh, in Florida, yoga. Uh, how many people were shot? I think there were three. It was the Women? medical director for Capital Health Plan. It was a college professor. It was a student that was killed by a disgruntled guy who thought he was her boyfriend. And so he came in to follow her, stalked her, and came in and shot them. What kind of facility was it again? It was called a hot yoga studio. Oh, it did. Is he the, are you, let me, let me see if I get this straight. Is this the one where the guy had a sexual addiction and he uh, blamed them and so he killed them because he blamed them? Is that the same guy? I, it might be. I'm not familiar with that information, but it could be. But All right. Well, just that that crisis involves so many people because it was in a plaza and there were people that were outside eating. There were people in other businesses. Oh, so she place. was killed. They were killed in public, not in the office. They were okay. killed in the yoga studio. But it wasn't seen by people outside the studio. No, but they could hear the gunshots and they could see the aftermath. And so there were multiple witnesses who were in the yoga studio. There were people who were outside who witnessed, you know, as the event had happened, went on, you know, when they go in their yoga studio and there's people dead. I mean, so there were a lot of people affected by that. Um, okay, so you've worked with extraterrestrial experiencers helping them understand their contact. How many, uh, relatively speaking, ballpark, how many extraterrestrial experiencers have you worked with in your days over the years? Just it doesn't have to be accurate, just a ballpark number that seems accurate to you in your mind. Maybe 50. Wow, that's quite a few. And uh, why do you feel that it sounds like maybe you either asked them to to come to you or somebody directed them to come to you or why do you even think you ended up getting 50 as opposed to the therapist right down the street got getting those same 50. Do you know why you got those people to you? Part of the reason is I'm an experiencer too. Okay. So I begin to recognize when there are signs and symptoms that somebody might have had an experience. So I will ask pointed questions to see things like people who are bipolar, who have mood shifts. I will say to them, many of my bipolar people are very perceptive people. And between the time when they're shifting from depression to mania or mania to depression, they're often very sensitive and aware of things. And sometimes they will have dreams or visions or encounters have anything ever happened to you like that? And then they start opening up. Oh yeah, this, this is okay. And in some cases, people will come to me because they have anxiety, they have night terrors and we'll explore it. Or I might do hypnosis with them to try to figure out why do you have this? Where did it come from? So it's because if you're looking for pink elephants, you might find pink elephants. A therapist not trained and not knowing how to ask the questions might not have any fewer, but they just don't know how to look for it. So you think the universe guided these people to you because you're also an experiencer? I do believe that, yes. Okay, so um, now that we've got to a, a very interesting part of this conversation, uh, tell us 
go into uh, how do we start this? So what's the earliest memory you have of a uh, any ex any of those types of events in your life? Or, or let me let me rephrase this. What's the very first strange thing of a paranormal, not necessarily alien, but of any type of bizarre event that you've had in your life, alien or not alien? What's the very first event you remember in your life of that's that's out of the ordinary? Um, as a toddler, talking to my ET friend that was with me till I went to kindergarten, playing with fairies and elves. Oh, look, well, hold on, stop. Toddler, you mean what What age, toddler? Um, uh, probably around two. Okay. And so your friend, tell us, go through, recall if you can, the very first time you remember uh, speaking to your friend when you were the toddler. I don't remember the first time because he's been with me until I went to kindergarten from beginning till I went to kindergarten. So I don't remember the first time. Well, the, the, but you remember the you remember something as the first time. Yeah, I remember being behind the couch in the living room in my house in Michigan when I was that age, talking to him and playing with him. Where in Michigan? Uh, Grand Ledge, outside of Lansing. I don't know either one of those, but the, the, the clients, some of the clients will know. It was in, I live 10 miles west of Lansing in Grand Ledge. Lansing is the capital of Michigan. So you were behind the couch and go go through that again. What, what happened exactly? I was behind the couch and I called him Robbie. Robbie was speaking to me and we were playing and um, he says to me, I can't go with you. I, I'm I'm going to go. And I said, go where? Because, you know, you've been with me all the time. He says, well, you're going to school now, soon. And so I was probably four, four and a half at this time. And he said, and you're not going to see me anymore. And I said, why not? And he said, because I can't go with you to school. And I said, well, why not? He said, because you can see me, but other people can't. And I said, OK. But why are you leaving me? He said, well, I just can't go with you, but you'll be OK. I'll still be around you. And I was very sad and my mom wanted to know, who are you talking to? I, I said, my friend Robbie. And she said, what? So my grandmother, my mother's mother was paranoid schizophrenic. So my mother thought that I was developing like my grandmother. She, so she said, don't talk about that. People will think you're crazy like granny. Don't don't mention that again. OK. So, so when you talked to Robbie, was it telepathic or ver or through your mouth? I would talk out loud, but I would hear him in my head. And when you heard him in your head, did you hear ideas, thoughts, words? What did you hear? I would hear words like like his uh, like you, like as if you were talking to yourself, that type of word? Not talking to myself, talking to a friend, talking to a playmate. He was but I mean, playmate. what I'm saying is, was he using the thought patterns in your brain? You know how you hear your own voice as if you're talking, when you're talking to yourself, you're, mm -hmm. cha you're just chattering along and you just, does it sound like that or did it sound like you were actually hearing an actual sound more than just a thought? It was telepathic, so I didn't hear a sound, but it was as clear as you and me talking. Right, but it was it was just a thought. If you define it that way, I would say yes. OK, so what did Robbie uh, the first time you remember seeing Robbie? Uh, you were he, you were on the same side of the couch or different side or what? Well, like I said, he'd been in my life since I don't remember the first time so that was the time I could recall very clearly other times I was a very sickly child so I was in bed a lot I had all sorts of digestive issues and so I would be in bed and I would be talking to him when I was in bed so that what did Robbie look like the best way I can compare it now he looked like Casper the ghost so he didn't have 
uh, Casper the ghost looks, there's no like uh, wrinkles or, or eyebrow, you know, it's no, uh, how do I put this? Casper looks uh, very simplified as far as ghosts go. He, he looks like an oversimplified uh, cartoonish character. He does. He look, that, is that still accurate? Well, Robbie had a more elongated head. Okay. And his his hands were kind of short and I don't remember fingers. So I remember it was more like they were turned under. I don't remember them being out. How tall was he compared? How tall was he? Uh, he was probably about three and a half feet tall. So did you see skin and bones and everything or? No. No. Um, he was non-corporeal. Looking back now, no. So he was, if he was non-corporeal, uh, what, if you don't consider him a ghost, you consider him an alien. Uh, looking back, why do you consider him a alien rather than a ghost? Because later in my life, when the alien showed up, it was one of them was him. Did he look different when when they showed up and one of them was him? Did he look different then than when you well, first? Well, here we get into my near death experience, February 26, 1991. Well, go through, go take us through that. OK. Um, it was a Tuesday morning. All right. Um, I was to have outpatient surgery to tack up my bladder because it had fallen. And it was a simple procedure. My husband at the time, now ex-husband, he dropped me off because I'd had many surgeries. And how, old, how old were you? Uh, this was 1991, and I was born in 51, so I was 39 at the time. Okay, go ahead. So he dropped me off, and I always said a prayer before I went under anesthetic because I always put myself in God's lap. So I... Hear the anesthesiologist say to me, count back from 100, so I count back, 99, 98, and I was out. And 15 minutes into the procedure, my blood pressure crashed. It bottomed out. And while it bottomed out, I became very lucid. I was more coherent and together than I was before anesthetic. Hold on, and, hold on, stop for a second. So do you know why your blood pressure bottomed out? Is that it just happened, it happened many times during surgery? Many times during many. You surgeries. just happened to be that sick. Yeah, I was that sick. Yeah. OK, yeah. Go, go ahead with your story. Go ahead. OK, so as the blood pressure bottomed out. I felt my body leaving my spirit, leaving my body, and I could see my body on the gurney strapped to the gurney. Right. And I rose out of the ceiling up through the ceiling and I was into a place where I could see it was like a doorway with a, a yellow light shining underneath the doorway. So I had no fear, no pain, no remorse. I knew exactly that I was right where I was supposed to be. And I felt a strong beckoning to come towards that door, towards that light. And as I went towards that door, towards that light, it was my thoughts that propelled me to that door. And so as I approach that door, I'm in the tunnel, the classic tunnel everybody talks about. And as I'm walking through the tunnel, the walls part and there approaches me, this 16 year old young male, his name is Mitchell. He was the child I miscarried 16 years before. And I immediately recognized him and I said, oh, Mitchell, it's you. Oh, stop for a second. So, um... When you saw Mitchell, what age did he look like when you saw him? He looked 16. 16. And he said and to me, Mom, here, I'm the age I would have been had I lived. That's what he told me. And how old was he when he died? I, I miscarried him, so I was about four or five months old. So he wasn't, oh, he wasn't even born? He wasn't even born, no. Okay. And you, call, you called him Mitchell? You named him before he even was born? Yes. And Okay, so he's 16. You're looking at him. Go ahead. And he said, here, I'm the age I would have been. Come on, you want to meet the others? And I just said, I'm, I was so marveling 
over, I can see you, I can touch you, I can feel you. And he hugs me, he says, come on. And I said, what others? He said, I'll show you, come on. So he grabbed my hand, I could feel. Right. The actual touch. I got in a little blue, dark blue rowboat, put my hands on the side of the boat. I could feel the tepid water, it, it was real. And he stood up paddling in quick, deliberate strokes. As we approach the shore, there's this whole group of people there at the shore and they come and pull the boat onto the shore. And I look around and I begin to recognize some of the faces. Granny Mildred, is that you? Alan Watson, you died when I was in fourth grade. Judy Gillette, you died the week before eighth grade. Wow, you all look so good. And then as I'm standing there, I said, hey, wait a minute, I've been here before. I remember July 1980 when I was stung by four bees. Do I get to stay this time? And they said, no. And I said, well, why did you bring me here? And they said, because there's things you need to do. And then once we tell you what they are, we're gonna show you, you won't remember them. But once we show them to you, once they happen, you'll remember that we showed them to you. So they showed me the videos. And then they said, but we'll oh, be there stop, to stop, guide oh, Stop, stop, back up. So they showed you the videos. How did you see the videos? What context were they? How, how were you seeing the videos? It would be like a hologram. So they were 3D? Yeah. Were you living inside the event or were you seeing no, it? No, I was the observer to the event. Okay, so you were seeing the event as a 3D holographic image outside of it. Okay, yes. go, go ahead with your experience. Okay, so I watched the videos and then they said, we're going to send you back, but we'll always be there to guide you. And I said, well, how am I going to remember to ask you to guide me if I'm not going to remember what you showed me? And they said, like this. And out of the crowd stepped a little boy. He was six years old. He lived on the roof outside my bedroom window. He was dead. He had been a patient there at that house because it was a doctor that owned the house before we moved into it. And he died. And he knew I could see him and I, I knew he could see me. And so he stepped out of the crowd. He said, remember him? I said, yeah. And then this seven foot tall male, who was the one talking to me, he said, do you remember the Indian chief that lived in your wardrobe? I said, of course, I was petrified. Everybody thought I was crazy. I didn't know why he was there. And so the seven foot tall male that was telepathically communicating with me transfigured into that Native American chief. And he said like this. So I said, okay. And then they whisked me back in my body. I was back on the operating table. They gave me medication to increase my blood pressure, but still keep me sedated. And then I came out of it and they took me to recovery, but because I was so sick and had an infection, I had to stay in the hospital. And true to what they said, it's now been 31 years. As things have happened, they have shown me. And what they told me that I was to do, the reason that I had to come back was twofold. One, that people in my life and people who would come to me as clients didn't love themselves. And my job was to love them until they could love themselves. And the second task that I was to do is that anybody who came to me as a client, this answers your previous question, they unconsciously chose me to work with them and that they were a gift being given to me. And it was my job to open up the gift and to bring the good from the inside to the outside. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. It's a fascinating story, but I didn't hear anything about an alien in there. You said it was going to. The seven foot tall male that telepathically communicated with me and Robbie, the, the one that came to me until I went to kindergarten, they were there in that crowd. OK, so the one of the when you were. Um, getting pulled out of the boat is when you're talking about. The crowd was there on the shore and one of the crowd members was the alien. Yeah. Did and you... the seven foot tall male that communicated with me telepathically transfigured into the Native American chief who was with me while I was growing up. And the seven foot tall male showed up a couple of times to me in spirit form 
and I knew later after the near death experience that that was probably an Arturian because he's shown up since that experience. He and Robbie have appeared to me and did healing on me. So, uh, okay, so Robbie, do you know what race Robbie comes from? I would say that he's a gray, but from the hypnosis that I had Kathleen Martin do on me, she said it's not consistent with a gray. And I said, well, I don't know what race he is. All I know is that's who he is. Uh, I don't think Kathleen Martin is qualified to say what is it consistent with grays or not but that's just between you me and everybody who's listening to this video <laughs> no i believe she's very well qualified she is well, very scientific and if and let, let's say for a second that she had a thousand patients who had gray clients mm -hmm. from a thousand different versions of the gray uh, you know a thousand different races that people would say oh that's a gray even then you know the the universe is infinite and um, the number of gray races are probably fairly large and like the, the probably the number of races that could walk amongst us and we wouldn't know they were alien is probably like almost infinite because you have a universe that's just our ver our version of the universe only not just this galaxy with the whole this whole universe just this one is almost infinite or it is infinite by itself that doesn't include any other timelines, any other universes or whatever. You get my drift, right? Mm -hmm. So there are probably umpteen jillion different types of grays out there. Because first of all, uh, let's just eliminate uh, pure grays. You've got, uh, according to what I've heard, you've got grays that are hybrided with every other thing that's out there. The reptilians, the whatever. They're all intermerged with everybody else. Uh, as far as the breeding goes, so you got you got not just umpteen jillion different types of grays that are pure grays. You also got umpteen jillion that are half grays and half something else. So you know to pin it all down to it's um, it is this characteristic is is for all grays. That just seems very egotistical to make that statement, but um, just my opinion. Anyway, I'm sure she's very qualified to a point um, on some level, but uh, I mean, I hear people like, uh, oh, what's his name? The guy that interviewed me. Uh, you ever listen to any of my interviews? Yes. Uh, let's see. Well, that's very nice of you. Most people say no. Ralph. <laughs> uh, hold on one second. I'm going to pull up my page with my interviews. And give give you the guy's name. Here we go. All right, because I don't like talking about somebody when I don't give their name. Um, oh, Joe Montaldo. Okay, so Joe is like to me, he's one of the most knowledgeable abductees alive. Okay, but he's made statements to me that are like, no, that's not right. Now I'm not saying he's not. Uh, how do I put this? I'm not saying he's lying and I'm not saying he's absolutely incorrect either. I'm saying within a within a uh, a particular context, he's absolutely correct. But when you go beyond that context, it's not necessarily correct. Now, I'll, I'm going to give you what I'm talking about so that we're on the and then you can comment on it. And th that'll be interesting, too. OK, so he made the statement to me. The Greys are in charge. The reptilians uh, work for them. And the Greys are the the big uh, universal police, okay. And any any time he's seen Greys in the presence of reptilians, the reptilians don't even look at the Greys. They're like totally subservient. You know, they won't even look in the eyes of the Gray because that he's that much more powerful. Now that's his truth. Now I'm not saying that is a lie. I'm not saying it's false. I'm not saying it's misleading. I'm just saying that's the context in which he's experienced those two beings. But uh, I also got interviewed by, uh, what was her name? I interviewed her too. One second here. Uh, Jesus, what is her name? Uh, the lady, Jesus, come on. Um, I did a dragon. She, she ran into the dragons and I was, 
interested in those. Um, there's another lady, and I can't pull up her name right at the moment. Um, she's got her own radio show. She is. Um, anyway, there's another lady. I'll just leave her nameless for the moment. I'll, I'll come up with her name in a minute. Uh, she made the statement that all, she, the difference between her and and, uh, and Joe is that Joe's most of his knowledge is on the from on the earth that he remembers his conscious knowledge. And as far as I can tell, unless I'm wrong, he doesn't have a huge amount of onboard remembrance. Okay, now the lady I'm talking about does. Okay, and she says that when she's on the craft. There's these huge craft with every different type of alien you can imagine. And she says nobody is above anybody else. They're all equals. So that doesn't sit with his knowledge. Now his knowledge doesn't have to be false, and her knowledge doesn't have to be false. They can both be true. But in some context, they just don't square with each other, even though they might both be true. Okay. So you get my drift. And so what do you have any comments? On uh, on that, from your perspective, my perspective comes with my interaction from the Council of Eight. I don't know if you've heard of the Council of Eight. I've heard of the Council of Nine, not the Council of Eight. Okay, well the Council. And that when you I say the Council of Nine, I'm talking about uh, Puharich's Council of Nine that the Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine was named after. Okay. And uh, the did you ever see the TV show Deep Space Nine? I don't recall seeing it. If well, I did, did you ever see the original Star Trek? Yes. OK, there was a uh, um, a uh, spinoff. Called Deep Space Nine, which was. Um, it wasn't like Star Trek in the sense that you're in a spaceship traveling around. It was a. A uh, space station. Uh, that they're on. That the start the the ships would come to that station. The station would move around, okay. And so this guy in question, he's the head of the space station, and I won't get into it too deep. But uh, it was called Deep Space Nine, and um, it's actually pretty interesting. If I were you, I, if I could get a hold of it, I would watch the just the pilot. Not necessarily the. I wouldn't necessarily recommend the whole series but the pilot was fascinating because this his name was Cisco on the show and he met these beings that were like God and when he met them he was like in a world where all there is is white there's him and white and nothing else you can't see the aliens because they're like God they're like infinite and and they're they're like don't really understand humans because they don't understand corporeal beings that die, they're like at such a level that they're only used to seeing other immortal beings like themselves. So they're checking him out like like he's a toy, you know, what is this uh, being that actually dies, you know, and he's checking them out because they're, you know, pulled him into their world. And uh, but it was fascinating in the sense that you get to see a conversation between a human and God and how that would play out in a science fiction series and it was pretty pretty I thought the pilot was better than any Star Trek movie I've ever seen so if you're into science fiction then it might be something worth your while to go find a copy of and watch it anyway so um, you were going to answer I asked you to comment on uh, Joe Montalvo's versus this other lady, what was your answer? Repeat your answer. OK, so based on my interaction with the Council of Eight. Yes, that, that I'm in contact with what they've explained to. We have an earthly council that is in connection with them and we are their spokesperson. To get their messages out, but what they've explained to us is that they are a representative group of many species who are part of this council and that there's good and bad of all types. Right. And that there are good and bad reptilians and that there are some species that refuse to work with the Intergalactic Council to try to have peacefulness throughout the whole 
universe. And so my response is there's good, there's bad. And it may be that the people that interviewed you or you interviewed her, their experience is this slice of life. So their experience, if they had a lie detector test, they'd pass, but it might be different than somebody else's, but they'd pass their test too. So you're saying you believe both stories are correct. They're just yes. slices of life. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's how I would answer it too. I can't say he's incorrect because that's his truth. That's what he experienced. I'm not going to call Joe a liar because I don't think he is a liar. So he's got his slice and she's got her slice. And it's I guess it's up to us humans to figure out why they don't connect. They don't kind of uh, fit very well together. Well, see, I believe that a lot of what is seen is like the holograph deck on Star Trek that you get projected for you what you need to see, what you can relate to that's in your paradigm. And, you know, a Hindu is going to see something that's familiar to them. A Christian is going to see something that they can relate to. And all of them are true experiences, but they may not match with each other. Well, that's how I would look at the other side. I never looked at this side that way, but um, I guess I, th I think... Um, one of the deepest truths of of of, um, of dreaming is that the dream dreams are a reflection of your of what you're you're going through at that time in your earthly life. You're you have a a particular idea of, or ideas about the world around you, and you get that those ideas reflected back to you in your dreams. Well, and that's only one of like many different purposes for dreaming. I'm not saying that's the reason, but that's a big reason. And so I, I look at reality as being very similar. If you believe X or Y or Z about reality, you're going to get that reflected back to you here also in the physical world. So is that that do yeah. you think uh, you think I got it right? I do. OK. All right. So Robbie is a. What is Robbie again? To me, he's a gray. He's a gray. That, that's how I describe him. Others is, may, he, is he colored gray or just look like a gray? He is kind of a, a bluish white. Bluish white. Because a lot of people do describe grays as bluish white, as being that's the correct color. They're not really gray. Uh, and so, and how tall was he again? He was about three and a half feet. Oh, so he was a short gray. Okay, so I did. I wasn't sure if you were talking about a short gray or a tall gray. So, and you said you had experiences with Arcturians also. That was a seven foot tall spirit that shown up at the near death experience. Showed up um, at the end of my bed, October 1969. Showed up in November of 1992. Um, different times. So, how do you know? That being is an Arcturian as opposed to, I mean, why, what makes you call him an Arcturian? Well, I can't say for certain he's Arcturian, but seven feet tall, I don't know any other race of beings that is that. So it might not be Arcturian, it might be something else, but that's just what I've called it. Okay, and describe uh, your Arcturian uh, contact. Okay. Um, the first one, the October 1969, it was three o'clock in the morning. I was in the house where the dead boy had been on the roof where the Native American chief lived in the wardrobe. And I'm sleeping in my sister's bedroom, three o'clock in the morning. I have graduated high school in June. This is October. I'm in the community college going to classes. And this spirit woke me up at three o'clock in the morning and said, you are to move to Rochester. I woke up out of a sound sleep and I said, what? Where were you I, living at the time? Michigan. Okay. Uh, where in Michigan? Grand Ledge. Oh, that's right. Go ahead. And so the spirit said, you are to move to Rochester, New York. Well, my sister had gotten married uh, in June of 1968 and she moved to Rochester, New York. And it's like, I'm not going to go there. I don't want to move there. I'm here. And it just said go. And then it was gone. So I learned over time, you don't really say no to them because they're going to oh, resist. 
before you before you go through your story, go go back uh, a minute. When you saw or con were contacted by this Arturian, give us the actual experience. What what did he? How did you experience that contact? Okay, I was sound asleep. I woke up because there was this bright light at the end of my bed, and I wake up. And he's communicating telepathically with me because I'm shaking because I'm thinking, is this Jesus? Is somebody coming to get me? Am I dying? What's going on? So I'm shaking and it was just a very commanding sort of thing. You are to move to Rochester, New York. And it was like, uh, -uh I'm not going to No, but it said go and then it vanished. So when you say there was a bright light in your bed, what actually woke you up? Because light doesn't generally wake people up if they're sleeping. It it was the presence. Oh, the presence of the you yeah. could feel the presence. Oh yeah. So you must have been partially awake, just a tiny bit. At three o'clock in the morning? Well, I don't I don't think so, but I wasn't there to, to But you weren't dream you weren't dreaming at the time. No. Right? No. I mean before when you got woken up. No. Do you okay? So you were, you might have been deep, but some part of you had to have been part, you had to have been partially awake a little bit to feel, just to feel the presence, unless it was like shaking the bed or something, just to feel that presence, your part of your consciousness had to be awake, is my opinion. But when you saw him in the light, was he in the light or of the light or how does that, well, give us more details about his appearance. He was the light. The light was, was the light. Yeah. OK, so was it like a shaft of of straight up and down light with no variance on the outsides or what? It would be almost like a hologram that it's it's projected. At the end of my bed, there's this figure is it, it isn't. If I tried to touch it, was was it three dimensional, two dimensional? Or it was three dimensional, but I'm not sure that I couldn't put my hand through it. I, d I didn't and, take time to ponder that. At the and moment. how bright was it as light? Oh, my goodness. It would be like a full moon shining in, but there wasn't a full moon shining in. So it wasn't terribly bright. It was just bright. It wasn't like blinding bright. It was pretty bright. Was it? It wasn't like turning on a light bright, but it was pretty light, pretty bright. So yeah. it kind of lit up the room even. Yeah. Yeah, it was almost like you were in a dark room when it happened, right? Yes. So your room was no longer dark at that point. Correct. OK, so it was projecting light out beyond itself. OK, I'm just trying to get the context. It's all right. did, did you see and what did you have? A, do you have a name for this being? No. And what? Uh, again, where did where did you get the context of Arcturian? Because there's got to be a lot of seven foot aliens out there. Why, why did you pin it talk to her? Well, I don't know what it is to this day. I don't know what it is. I have just thought it probably was. I don't know. what. Oh, so you know. got you got the idea somewhere that it was our yes. yes, that's to, uh, uh, a thought that's in, that came into your mind at some point. Yes. And you could be correct. You might be mistaken. Correct. That is All right. right. But you don't have a name for this being. I do not have a name because he shape shifts. Tell, tell us about the shape shifting. All right. Remember, I told you about the near death experience where the seven foot tall right. figure is talking to me telepathically. And I said, so, How will I remember to ask? Hold on, stop, I stop. Seven foot tall figure. What does the seven foot tall figure look like? Like the same one that was at the end of my bed in 1969. Yeah, but in you, you're talking about with the light. But you said with the light, he was he was the light. He didn't look like a human or, or you know, when, you know, you're, you're where I'm coming from, right? Not really. OK, so if uh, uh, how do I put this? Was it there a vertical bright shaft of light with the with the consciousness speaking to you from it? Or was there a uh, uh, shaft of light with a being standing in the middle of it or? Was there a, a a what looked like a humanoid creature that was made of light? You, you know where I'm coming from. I'm trying to get a little more detail. The being was light. Right. So no. it was, 
but he but did he have edges like like you would like if you drew Casper the ghost and or defined he had, edges? He had an outline of form. There was an okay. outline of a form. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. It wasn't a so shaft of light. Of the form being of light. Would it the light lit up the whole form? Right, right. As it, if as if a flashlight was, was shining behind it, illuminating it. Right, but the light was was mainly the bright the, the, the bright part of the light was mainly within the form. Yes. To its edge. Okay, yes. so it wasn't a shaft of light; it was a being of light. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, as a being of light, how many, how much, what kind of details could you see in this being of light? Was it? a more mostly featureless being of light or could you see like uh, like if he had walked around the bed from the from the end to the side and you got a better look at him do you think you could see uh the skin and into the skin and and uh, muscles and how, how much detail do you think that, that you could no, see i don't think i could it was too bright was it, it too was bright? Right. And when he came subsequently before, I mean, after those times and in the near death experience, I I couldn't get a physical form out of it. So on the other side, when you saw him on the other side, he was one of those five people. Did he was that same uh, light being of light? He was that same exact yes. being. Yes. OK, so there wasn't any difference. No. OK, now, you know, now that, you know, with all these questions, you know, you kind of you get a little more context of how, it, you know, exactly. Um, and when he came. In November of. 92, it was the same form, same one of 1969, same one in the near death experience. When he came, I think it was. Um, April of 2015, same form, same thing. So you've interacted with him how many times, relatively speaking? Oh, multiple times, but these like are- Like hundred, hundreds of times or dozens? Well, of I'll take a little tangent here and that will explain it. Good, we All like right. tangents. Part of the Council of Eight is a being that's in the ninth dimension. And she is what is called a watcher. She is, it's, her name is Shiva, S-H-E-E-V-A. It's not the India God. Right, right. I got it. OK, she looks a lot like this seven foot tall male. The other ninth dimension being is called Ra, R-A-H. It's not the Ra God of Egypt, but OK. So Different. so Shiva and I have an ongoing relationship. And what she tells me and she actually physically shows up sometimes to me. I don't know if anybody else would see her, but I actually see her. She also is a, like seven foot tall and she has bird like. Wings that are like bird feathers and she calls me her daughter. She doesn't just say daughter. She says you are my daughter and that we sent you here. You agreed to come here to facilitate for others so that they can become awakened and to realize what their purpose is. So. My contact with this seven foot tall thing is now understood. We work together. It's not like I'm an experiencer and this being keeps showing up. It's that we have agreed to do this work and they come back to remind me, oh, you're supposed to do this now. So Shiva told you about the. The being of light that was in your bed, she told you about him. Well, she didn't particularly it's my contact with the council of eight where they as the whole council different species reveal things to me can you uh council of eight can you go through do you have you met all of the council of eight have you met yes. okay so can you go through each member uh i will do my question? best um do you know who kevin briggs is not a clue okay kevin briggs is a retired policeman from England. He started having contact with the council when he was eight years old. Ort and Dee are a married couple and they're Arturian and they showed up in his bathroom, petrified him. Give that, give us that again one more time. Okay. Kevin Briggs, yes. eight years old in England. Right. Ort and Dee. Ort and 
O R T and D E E, husband right. and wife team, are part of this council of eight. They show up when he's eight years old. Right. It's petrified. He's in the bathtub taking a bath, and the water turns cold, and he's not getting out because he's he doesn't know what to do. He's petrified, and he can hear them talking, and they're saying, "Are you sure this is the boy? He's awful young." And they're going, "Yes, we we can teach and we can train him." So, from that time onward. They begin to teach him how to connect with the council, how to be out of body, how to create his own craft, how to call craft in, all these kind of things. So he, from the time he's eight to the time he's now in his 60s, he learned how to do all this. And then this council said to him, you need to let the world know we're here. You need to expand. You need to come out of the closet with all this. So in... August of 2016, he went to a MUFON conference. I happened to also go to that conference because I had had experiences that I was trying to figure out what they meant. Which, which, year? Met, which year was the conference? 2016 in Orlando. And what was the name of the conference? MUFON. But I mean, okay, it was the MUFON Florida State Conference. Okay, go ahead. With well, it was for the whole... Move on for all the country. Oh, for the whole, held, you're talking about for the whole country. Yeah, it was held there. The, that the national event. event. Oh, okay, now I got you. Go, go, so, go for it. So I met Kevin while we were having lunch. And he explained to me, he said, you know, I've heard that you might be able to help me because he knew I worked with experiencers and, and I believed people and helped them. So he said, you know, I've been told I need to get this word out. I need to spread this information and I said well yeah so we met with him me Kathy Martin Denise Stoner and Kathy Martin is the niece of Benny and Barney Hill the couple that was abducted in New Hampshire yes. 1961 yes. so she and Denise and I met with Kevin and he started to talk and he didn't realize that he was giving us information that he himself didn't know. And he didn't Denise know, and I, did he know that while he was speaking it? He did not know. Interesting. Go ahead. So Denise and I talked about it. We said, do you know what he's doing? And she laughed. She said, yeah. I said, yeah. And Kathy said, what? And we said, he's channeling that information. He does not know that information. He doesn't know physics. He doesn't know all this stuff that he, these mathematical equations, he's a retired policeman that had no knowledge of such Denise things. said this to you. Go well, ahead. She and I discussed it together, yeah. All right. And so we then said, well, it'd be interesting to pursue this to see if what they're saying is, is real. So we began to do research. We did thermometers. We did voice recorders. We measured the temperature in the room. We watched how the body language changed. And the second time, I think it was, we met as a group to have the information come and meet this council. My phone got fried. It absolutely fried. I took it to the repair shop. They said, what did you do to it? I've never seen anything like this. How did it get fried? What was the context? The connection with the Council of Eight coming through. They called you? They, they spoke through Kevin. Right. And as they were giving us information, that vibration, that frequency destroyed my phone. How close was your phone to Mr. Briggs? Maybe four feet away. Oh, it was fairly close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, when we you're, talking about a land, you're talking about a landline. No, a cell phone. Cell phone. And what year was this? 2016. Okay, go ahead. So we began to meet monthly and we got introduced to the members of the council. So I can't tell you the species of all of them, but I can try to remember all the names. Sure. So, so there's Ort and D, there's Arna and Orla, there's Targ and there's um, Zark, spelled J A R K, there's Ra and Shiva and Chika. Chica is an insectoid, and I'd have to look up. I have it on my phone, but I don't remember what species each one is, but that's the council. And if you don't remember what species they are, do you remember what they look like, any of them? 
in Kathleen Martin's book, Forbidden Knowledge, she has pictures of them. So you can go our research. Actual page. photographs or drawings? Drawings of, of what each of us has seen, yeah. Interesting. And for some of us, we actually see them in physical form. Others see them in our third eye. So does Kathleen have the same connection to the Council of Eight that you have? Yes, and so does Denise, and so does Kevin, yes. Really? All four of you have yes. similar connections? Yes. Okay, so describe your connection to the Council of Eight in some fashion. Or when we are in the presence of the Council or about to call in the Council when we get in a meditative state, we will feel like there is a vibration going on all throughout our body, a trembling. We will feel, and we measured this the last time we met two weeks ago, I walked in front of the field meter that measures the temperature. Before I walked in front of it, it was 76 in the room. When I walked in front of it, it went up to 90 when I was in front of it. When I do a thermometer on Kevin, when he's doing his channeling, when we start, it's the temperature at room 76. Within two seconds, it went up to 88. And then when he was done channeling, he's sweating profusely. And when he's done, then it goes back down. So you're using a regular field meter. Do you have it near you now? I don't know. Denise has the equipment. I don't have the equipment. OK, so it was her field meter. Mm -hmm. And. Um, how did you meet Denise and how did you meet Kathleen? I contacted the MUFON organization after I'd had the experience of the seven foot tall and Robbie showing up beside my bed because I was very ill. I have a number of medical conditions and I woke up to them standing beside my bed and I wasn't frightened because I recognized them. And I said, what are, why are you here? And they said, we came to work on your bladder because I'd had a bladder infection for about two years. They couldn't get rid of. So they said, we're here to work on you. So they said, go back to sleep and we'll work on you. So they did. And when I woke up the next morning, my eyes were all, the pupils were black and I had an intense headache and I had a mark on my forehead. So a couple of instances like that, I contacted the MUFON organization to say, can somebody help me figure out what this means? I'm not give me, scared give, of it. Give, me, give us your symptoms again, exactly what did you wake up with? Okay, when I woke up in the morning, the pupils were all black. All black, day. right. I had a headache. Right. From the pressure from the inside out. I have a benign brain tumor inside on the frontal lobe and it felt like pressure. You still have it? Yes, I still do. Okay. Go and ahead. there was a mark on my forehead, like an imprint. Color? And on one of the times when they worked on me, when I woke up the next morning, I had three finger imprints on my inside of my thighs. Well, that sounds like grease, but it could be anything with three fingers. Well, it could be, but I felt they were working on me. I didn't feel that it, that it was an invasion. It was it was work. Help. Right, right. So. So. Um, so one of the members of the um, the Council of Eight is the Zark person. He's a scientist, but he's humorous. He will do things to let us know he's present, and he likes to take my jewelry. So often when I travel to go meet with the research group, they're four hours away from me. One of my earrings will show up somewhere else or missing. When we met and we meditated as a research team two weekends ago, the light started flickering and went off. And then after I, we finished and I got up to go to the bathroom, a penny dropped out out of nowhere and rolled on the floor. So those are the kinds of things that Zark likes to do. And I've asked him telepathically, why do you do that? And he laughs and he says, you are so serious. It's just for fun. You take life too seriously. And I said, OK, but I want the earring back. It belonged to my mom. Please bring it back. And sometimes it will come back and it will show up in a very prominent place that I didn't leave it because I looked there 10 times and it wasn't there. Right. So I'm not being skeptic. I'm not because I'm, I'm an experiencer myself, but. Um, and this isn't in context of aliens, but OK, it's just a general question I have to ask you. Um, a lot of people think that a lot of Christians, I shouldn't say a lot of people, I'll say a number of religious people, Christians specifically, think that aliens are demons. Now, I'm, I don't have any 
notions along those lines personally. Uh, but let's say for the sake of argument that somebody asks you that question or what would you say to a person who asked you such a question? OK. It's a very excellent question because that's one of the things they told me to talk about. My guides told me to talk about today. Demons are on a lower vibration. And normally, well, in every experience that I've had dealing with them, they're negative. The aliens that I personally deal with and the ones that I help people to understand their experience, they come to find out the aliens were not negative. They might have been doing research. They might have been examining them. They might have been taking eggs yeah. or sperms or whatever or DNA, but it wasn't to harm the person that they were getting it from. It was either to perpetuate the race or to create children that would be their hybrid offspring or something that affects. So to me, the difference is in the vibration. And if somebody's got a negative attachment, I teach the person to ask, what is the function of that negative attachment? Why do you feel that Satan's attacking you? What benefit would Satan have for doing that? Because Satan was designed to be initially a teacher to test your faith. So what is it about this experience? Why do you have this attachment? What function does it serve? And so when I get them to explore that, they go, well, I never thought about that. My church says, you know, it's evil and I need to stay away from it. Okay, why? Maybe it's supposed to teach you something. So uh, we're going to diverge here for a second. Um, what, um, how many people have you worked with, relatively speaking, ballpark, that have had attaching spirits and you've worked with them in that area? Ballpark, how, would you, how many people would you say you've worked with in that area? In my 40 years of doing this work, probably over 300. Okay. So um, give us an idea of how that's worked for you as far as go all the way from it was extremely successful or or it didn't work at all to it was, it was totally, absolutely, extremely successful and maybe even more so than we ever expected on one end and it wasn't successful at all on the other end. And give us kind of a, a flavor of that whole um, field in reference to your clients without giving out any too many specifics that you're uh, not wishing to talk about. Okay. Trying to be, you know, generic but specific at the same time. Okay. I have to do an assessment on the situation before I can do any extraction or um, removal. So you do removals yourself? Yes. OK, and and. Um, how, what exactly do you do when you do a removal? Specifically. Number one, I do a prayer of protection around me. Right. And I ask for guidance. I ask for help and what I'm doing. And I go in and I use kinesiology, whether I'm working with a person or the place. And a lot of times it's a church that so has you're, you're talking about. You're talking about removing attachments from somebody who's physically in your presence. Um, sometimes I also do it when people are on screen. OK, so. Um, go through the uh, one of the ones you've done. Uh, generically speaking with somebody who was not physically in your presence. How did that go? OK, I had a person who is Wiccan by belief. Right. And she knew that she had attachments and I had her go through the house and I asked her to find places where the temperature was different and she did. And I asked her, you know, um, her practice in um, magic and arts and things. And did she protect herself? Was she doing white magic, black magic, that sort of thing? And I asked her, what did the attachment do? Was it making her feel like she didn't want to live? Was it affecting her health? Was it affecting her relationship? Was there um, something that she could smell, taste, feel? And so we go through that whole checklist. And once we figure out what it is, then I asked her, let me assess to see how many there are. So I use kinesiology to see how many are present. Hold on, stop for a second. Um, 
when you say you use kinesiology, she's not present with you. What, uh, what, what, what specific kinesiology technique do you use? Okay. Let me explain how it's done, and then maybe that will answer your question. Okay. Just like you and I are in a different location right now, but we're present in this moment energetically. Right. Okay? If I was having a phone call with somebody in Australia, you know, what, 18 hours ahead of me, it would be the present moment that we're having that interaction. Right. So energy is not confined by distance. So that I, because of my intention and her intention, we can make that energetic connection so I can use the kinesiology to ask the question. And then if she knows how to do it, I can have her validate it, her do it as well to check out energetically. Kinetic. But I mean, do you have her, the person, <clears throat> hold their arm up and then push down or what, what exactly? Well, if they were in my office, I would do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, what but do you, if, how do you do it over the screen though? What do you, over the screen, I use a pendulum. You see it? So, yeah, you you move the pendulum and you ask for a yes and no and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you say kinesiology, you're talking pendulum. Pendulum, yes, yes. Would you consider pendulum being part of kinesiology? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so besides Robbie and the Arcturian and the Council of Eight. Uh, what other aliens, if any, have you had experiences with? I have not personally had other experiences because I feel like I'm partially from there. So to me, I don't need from, from where from where there from where? the ninth the, dimension. Not the ninth. No, I would say I'm not the fifth either. Maybe the fourth um, that I incarnated into this body to be a facilitator where I actually came from. The way they'd explain it to me is when you're in spirit form, you don't have to be any particular location. Right, right, but I mean. You think it's the, the fourth dimension? I don't know for sure. I haven't asked. But I can't ask, but in order for me to come into this body, I had to come into the third dimension. How far a transition I had to make, I don't I don't know. I haven't researched that. So, so do you remember any, besides your, <coughs> your, <coughs> your one near-death experience, do you remember um, any other experiences beyond the physical? Yes. How many how many experiences have you had beyond the physical, relatively speaking? How have you had? Uh, I would say I can have one when I meditate if, if I go deep into meditation. I've done that since 1991, deep in meditation like that. So you can get out of your body at will? I wouldn't say at will, I have to work at it, but yes. So it's kind of difficult for you, but it does work. Well, it's not really difficult. It, it's just, I have to have a secure environment to do that. Right. I have to mentally put aside whatever I'm in this dimension worrying about to free myself up to go there. And I can do it, it's just a matter of, it's, I have to have the intention and set up the environment. So when you get out of your body, typically speaking, where do you go? I meet with the Council of Eight. And when sometimes you're I travel, sometimes when I you're travel. when you're in the count in the presence of the Council of Eight, um, what is the context in which you're there with them? What what's beyond their bot your your presence and their presence? What else? What's the context? Usually, I'm going because there's a healing chamber that they have. The Council of Eight operates, and I can take people to the Council. To the chamber and so that's usually why i'm going there and either it's to put me in it or to put bring somebody else to it with their permission so have you had um problems in your body that you remember exactly what that problem was that was healed in that chamber yeah and name um, name what was healed okay. tell us what was healed 
when it's multifaceted. I have had chronic Lyme disease for probably three or four decades. So you got it from a tick? Hmm? Got it from a tick? Yes. And where were you when you got you believe you got well, it? I've, I've had five tick bites that I remember. Really? Yeah. So which of those gave you the Lyme disease? Probably all of them. Oh, really? Yeah. So you keep getting it over and over. Because my belief, this isn't documented, it's not science. I believe that we give off a scent to the tick and they can hone in on us. Right. right. It could be true. Yeah. It's no yeah, reason why. Because I, I can be in a place where nobody else gets a tick and I get a tick. Well, we know that from mosquitoes, you know, that you'll be in a group of people and you're the only one getting bitten and nobody else is getting bitten. So they obviously like you better. Yeah. So, okay. So you got, you got your Lyme's disease. You're saying you're totally free of your Lyme's disease? No, I'm not totally free, but there were many conditions that go along with that. Um, Morgellons is a skin disorder that you get along with Lyme disease. And do you think it, do, oh, stop. Do you think that Morgellons is a symptom of Lyme's disease or just a, something else totally unrelated that just happens to be connected it, somehow? It is like a co-infection. Not everybody who gets Lyme's disease gets Morgellons, but I've not heard of anybody who got Morgellons who didn't have Lyme disease. Oh, really? I've never heard that before. Okay. You know what Morgellons is? Yes. Okay. Do yeah. you know who uh, James Renz is? Mm-mm. He was a um, a very well known talk show host like Art Bell. Uh -huh. and, uh, he had it. He still has his own show, but it's only on a uh, his website. It's not um, it's not broadcast anymore. And so, but he's been around forever and ever. Like you know, who William Tompkins is. Mm -mm. Okay, William Tompkins was a. Um, a fellow who claimed to be um, the designer. He was part of a team that designed the, the command and control unit of the first Apollo uh, craft that we sent up. And uh, he claimed to work directly with uh, Pleiadians or I can't, I think they were Pleiadians, but I, I'm, not I'm not absolutely gonna swear they were Pleiadians, but I think uh, it was either Palladians or Arcturians. It's one of the alien races that we think are good that look like humans, look exactly like us. And he said that he was in a think tank at a particular a company. And a lot of this is verified that he actually did what he did. But there's some things he said that are a little beyond the pale. But um, but a lot of it is is known, verified. And... Uh, but he said that these aliens were working with us to develop the Apollo uh, craft. And uh, anyway, uh, the only reason I brought him up is because uh, he was brought into the public eye by Jeff Rents. Oh. Okay, and he's, he's a fairly well-known contactee person. But his contactee experiences are not like alien lands and you go out and meet alien or anything like that. Or nothing like yours either. His alien experiences were like they worked in the office, and you went in and saw them every day, that uh -huh. sort of thing. And uh, you know, I I can't uh, verify his story is totally true, but a lot of it has been verified. You know, as far as him working in those facilities, there are other people that remembers him from where he worked in those facilities. So, anyway. Uh, I digress, but that, that was just my way of letting you know who Jeff Prince was. Okay. Anyway, uh, I forgot how we got off on that. What were we talking about before? We we're talking about. We, we've gone off in many tangents, so I don't remember which one we were on last. Okay, so that's fine. Go back to uh, all the alien races that you've had direct contact with that are not the, uh, not the uh, Council of Eight and not Robbie and not the. Arcturian, what else have you encountered? And give us a, a direct uh, experience sort of thing with anybody else, that uh, any other aliens that you, or it doesn't have to be an alien. It could be an angel, an alien, a demon, a, 
a uh, Earth spirit, any anything else you've interacted with of that really comes to your mind as I ask this question? Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be confined to aliens. Okay. The, completing one of the topics we were on about how I go about doing the detachment from somebody or a home. Right. Is once I figure out through kinesiology and validation by the person on the other end or I'm in their house and pick up on it, then what I do is I talk to that attachment because that attachment has a purpose. And until that purpose is complete, it's it's going to remain unless there's certain things that we do. So, so you try to find out what the purpose is. Trying to find out what the purpose is. So I ask and use kinesiology or I hear it. I'll hear the high pitched squeal or I'll hear a clear answer in my head and I'll say, were you sent by somebody? And yes or no. Um, were you once a living human being? Yes. Um, did somebody send you? No. Um, were you once of the light side? Yes. Are you doing this as some karmic repayment? Yes. OK. Are you wanting to be done with this? Yes. All right. And then I say to them, what you came to do is complete now. You have finished. You have a choice. You can now go back to the light side and you don't have to do this anymore because it's complete. Or you can stay on the dark side if you choose to. It's your option. And so they choose. And I use my pendulum so that the client can see what I'm doing. And if they want to go to the light, then I tell them you will see an opening. And that is going to be like a light that's a magnet that draws you into that light and go. And then they do. And then I check after, have they gone? And if they don't want to, if they choose to stay on the dark side, then I use my training, which is by the power that's been invested in me by God and by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, whose discipline I follow, I order you to depart from this person, this place, this universe, this dimension, and you can't return to any property, person, place, thing ever. Go now. And then I check to see if they're gone. So you do, you do this with a pendulum. The whole thing is done with a pendulum. Well, it's not the whole thing. If I'm in person, then. Oh, when, when, when they're in distance, it's all pendulum. Well, it's not all pendulum because I will ask the person all along. Tell me what you're getting. Tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what you're hearing in your head. Tell me what emotion you're getting. What physical symptom are you getting? So they're working together with me. And then when the process is over, I will ask them, tell me how you feel. 99.9% .9 of the people say, I feel lighter. And I don't tell them to say that. That's what they say to me. And then I have them go around with um, either sage and then sage all the room to get whatever negative energy is out. And then I will have them take like um, olive oil and put it in a little dish and Put the sign of the Holy Spirit into it to bless it, make the sign of the cross on the doorways and outside. And if I'm there, then I will check for portals inside and outside the house too. And if there are portals there, I close them because portals are free reign for anything and everybody to come in. So I close them. So With you close them from a distance. You know, are, are you talking about in person closing them or closing them from a distance? When it's in when it's at a distance, I give instructions on how to do it and get them to have people go with them to do it and then let me know how it went or they can take their phone with them out as they're doing it. And how many of how many of these clearing you said you did 50? Is that what you said relatively? Well, I, I, no, the clearings on people and and buildings and things in the 40 years I've done it probably more than 300. OK, and how many of those were buildings versus people? Oh. Percentage wise, it doesn't I have to say just a, the all, buildings, maybe a hundred. Oh, so it's the buildings is a third and the people is two thirds. Probably, yeah. And how many of those times have you done it where you confidently feel you failed? That that it, that it, that it didn't work and is just not going to work because of whatever reason? I have never felt that it didn't work because I don't own it. It's not me saying I failed. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying your failure. I'm just saying. Right, but I'm just I'm saying I never got that feeling that it wasn't successful. Now I had somebody come back to me and say it's back. I've never 
in 40 years had anything come back because I told it it couldn't. But then I find out that when that happens to somebody, there's someone else bringing stuff in. And it might be somebody who is, because in one case, the kids were playing with the Ouija board and calling up spirits and doing rituals. And so that kept bringing stuff in, not the stuff that I sent out, but new stuff. And then in some cases, the people were mentally not stable. And so it was a mental health condition that they were experiencing new stuff coming in. So I had to work on, is this mental health or is this demonic? Right, right. So um, I'll go back to the, my previous question. What other beings have you, or not necessarily beings, but uh, beings or creatures or anything, doesn't even have to be a being, what all have you else have you interacted with besides the ones we've talked about? Well, I interact with people that have crossed over. Um, I had an instance a couple months ago. I was awakened in the middle of the night with the word Nashway. And I didn't know what it was, so I wrote it down and I asked one of my friends who is able to connect and she researched it. She's in Massachusetts. Her name's Penny. And she said, I know what it is. She called me back and let me know. And I said, well, what is it? She said, it's a Native American tribe, Nashaway, and that they were in Massachusetts where she was. And she said that they have dispersed and intermarried with other tribes and they don't exist anymore. She said, but they're on your property. I am building a house that the ETs told me to build. It's a round house made out of cement and it will have a roof where you can do sky watching. And she said, they're at your property. So she told me to go to my property and talk to them. So I did, and I could see them in my third eye. They were Native American natives and they were there. And there were a group of them, about 20. And I said, why have you called me here? And they said, because we've been waiting for you. We have been protecting this land for these centuries and now we're gonna turn it over to you. And I said, that's a pretty heavy burden. I'm not sure that I can take care of that. And they said, no, we'll, we'll still be around. You can call on us, we'll be here. But they said, we need you to give us permission to go to the great spirit in the sky or whatever it's called. And I said, okay, but if you promise you'll be here to help me. And they said, yes, they will. And so I did. So I have encounters like that where someone will come to me, but it's not an alien being per se. It's just. Spirit. So when you encountered the Indians, uh, did you encounter them directly when you went outside and went to a particular location or did they come to you in your house or what? how did you experience them? I went outside to the edge of the woods where I could feel them. And could you actually see them when you? In got my third eye, yes. If I open my eyes, no, but in my third eye, yes. Okay, how did they look in your, when you closed your eyes and you looked in your third eye, what did they look like? Like Native American Indians? Like like people who were still alive and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you describe them? I don't know what the Nashua Indians, Nashua Indians look like. Um, were they short, tall, uh, it would, dark? It would have been maybe five foot six, five foot seven, um, dark hair, straight, um, kind of like a bronze colored skin. Um, and they spoke, the way that I can relate it to is I grew up in Michigan, so I'm used to people having a Michigan accent and I worked on Mackinac Island in the summer times and there were Native Americans that still lived there. And so the way that the Nashua spoke was familiar to me. And I can't I can't describe it because I don't know anything. It's it would be almost like somebody from Canada that A um I I would have to get somebody who speaks the way that I heard them speak to tell you that's how they spoke. I'd have to find somebody. So is any of their descendants still alive or are they are they wiped out completely? From what we could read about them, they are not in existence now. There's nobody 
any descendants of the tribe. Interesting. So who else have you encountered besides the Nashua and your, that we haven't talked about? Um, my second husband died after we had been married only 10 months and he's come to me about three times since he's passed. Well, what it, when he comes to you, what is he, uh, why does he, other than just to be in your presence, is there any particular, did he have any particular message to give you when he came to you? And, he did. The first time he came, it was just um, maybe a couple weeks after he died. And this was um, a few months before they did work on my body, where the seven foot tall and Robbie came and worked on my body. And he came to the house we had at Alligator Point in Florida. And it's like time stops. I got chills. I could feel his presence as if I could reach out and touch him. I could not see him but it's like you know somebody's there it's it, you can't describe it unless you've experienced it but he came and I said Woody what are you doing here he said I came to check on you and I what's, said what's his name Woody Woody okay go ahead and I said why are you here and he said I I'm worried about you I told you I would take care of you and I, I you know I'm sorry I had to go I said Woody your job was to love me till I could love myself, just like I was supposed to do for other people. And you did that. You helped me to heal from what I'd been through. You did your job. It's okay. You can go. Go to the light. He said, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. Go. That was the first time. That was the first time, yeah. What about the second time? The second time was um, my grandson was spending the night with me and my sister was there. Um, we were going to do a memorial service for him. And I felt him sleeping beside me. I could just feel his body. I could feel the warmth. And when I woke up in the morning, I asked my grandson, who is also has abilities to see and know things. He was three at the time. I said, do you know where Woody is? He said, yes, Grandma. And I said, well, where did you see him? He said, he was sleeping right beside you. Who is this you're talking about? My grandson. He was grandson? three at the time. Okay. And then my sister, I said, did you sense any? She said, yeah, Woody was here last night. I could feel him. I could hear him. And I said, yeah, he was. So that was the second time. So he was just there because he wanted to be there. Yeah. That time. Yeah. yeah. The third time? And the third time was recently, about a month or so ago. And he came through. I said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be over there. And it, same electricity. You feel like your body's on fire. It's just like intense, like you've been struck by lightning at all. I don't know what that feels like, but it's just your whole body is just like vibrating. And I said, well, why are you here? And he said, I just came to tell you something. And I said, OK. And he said, well, I miss you. And I said, well, I miss you, too, but it's OK. And he said, I just want to tell you that you're going to be doing more work with the council. I've been talking to them. And I looked at him. And I said. Woody, how do you know the council? And he laughed. He said, over here, there are no barriers. We know everything. Everything is known. I said, OK, anything else? He said, nope, love you. And he was gone. Interesting. That was a, that was probably the most interesting message he gave was that uh, that on the other side, the, the council is known. Well, just the fact that on the other side, they know everything, that's, that's a pretty uh, awesome message to give. So, yeah. So, what? Who else have you? Who else have you uh, encountered? Well, I get clients, family members coming all the time. So it's it's nothing. So when you when you have their ca uh, family members come to you, how do you experience them? Do you see them in your third eye, inside your head, with your eyes closed, in your third eye, or do you see them? with your you know, eyes open, or how do you experience these different people? It comes in different ways. Sometimes it will be a flash in my third eye with my eyes open. It will be like an, an item. For instance, one of the clients, the mother came through and she was wearing a blouse that had a tie at the neck, you know, a bow tie, white blouse. And so I'm talking to the client and I say, who is it? because I don't know who it is. Who is it that wears a blouse with a bow tie at the neck? Oh, that's my mother. I was asking for proof that she was around me. And I said, well, she just told me to tell you 
She heard your request and she's here. She is around you. So when you were seeing the lady with the uh, bow tie around her, you saw her in your mind's eye, right? With your eyes closed or open or? Open. Open, really? Yeah. And uh, did did she appear like in the middle of your head or out in front of you or how did you see her? It's, it's off like to the top to the right. It's like they're. Was it persistent or just a flash? It's a flash. OK, but right. sometimes it'll be a squeal in my right ear of something they want me to tell them. And I will make the decision of whether it's appropriate to tell. Right, them. Right, right, right. You mentioned that before. Yeah. So who else have you encountered besides uh, dead people, dead um, Indians? On, on August the 20th, Jesus came to me during. I met a sap. And I was flabbergasted because, you know, that's not something you expect to happen. And I had a conversation with him and I said, could you please explain to me why you had to suffer, why you had to be crucified? I don't understand. And he said to me, they didn't understand what I was about and they were afraid. They were afraid of losing power and control. And so they do that out of fear. And he said, you know, that's that's how it was. And I said, OK, is that what's going on in our country now? The great divide politically, emotionally, religiously. And he said, yes, he said those people who are so fearful and so angry and spewing all this vitriol on both sides, they really don't love themselves. And your job is to tell them about your near death experience and to also tell them about this encounter you had with me. And you are to love those who you disagree with and who are angry, and you are to love them and show non judgment towards them. So, when he appeared to you, was it during the middle of the day or an evening? Or? My friend was doing Reiki on me, and I just go into meditation. And oh, so you were inside yourself internally? Yeah. yeah. And what did he look like to you? What did, how did he appear to you? He had olive skin. He had kind of um, dark brown, long hair. You say olive skin. What what is that color? Um, it would be like somebody a uh, um, mid eastern kind of. Oh, a little bit darker. Like, yeah. Darker than mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, olive skin and what else? Um, had on like what would be like a tunic. And had sandals on his What's feet. A tunic? What's a tunic? What is uh, that? A long piece of cloth you wear. Okay. That, right. that you put over your head. It'd be like a long dress. Right, right. Yeah. And, and then sandals. Mm -hmm. All the typical stuff. But what did it? Did he have blue eyes? I didn't see his eyes. He was he was sitting right beside me. I mean, like we were sitting like on a bench. He was right beside me. Right, right. So he had olive skin, sandals, a tunic, and uh, and he looked kind of Middle Eastern, sort of. And um, did you just now relate everything he said to you, or is there anything else he said to you that you want to relate? That's, that's what he related to me. Relate to me, yeah. And he give us his message to you one more time, because that's important. He said that my job is to find the people that are so angry and judgmental and to show them love and non-judgment. And basically give them something maybe they've never had before. Yeah. Maybe they've never had anybody uh, that they've interacted with who gave them that in their whole life, which would be pretty bad. I preached about this last week. I was the guest preacher at my church and I talked about my near death experience and about this and I said that people who are part of a group that all have one mind it's called group think yeah so that you know you go along to get along because you're afraid to say anything different so I gave two examples of people who had been part of a group and by people showing them love and respect and concern and non-judgment they changed from how they believed within the group and one of them was um, Derek Brown who used to be the head of the youth movement for white supremacy 
And the other one, his name is Stephen Ayers. He was part of the insurrection on January 6th. And he appeared before the Senate committee. And he said, you know, I believed what I was told. And they said, okay, but why did you then change? And he said, because I began to hear things outside of that group. And when I found out how many lawsuits there were and information that I was told in the group, then I began to think that maybe what I had been told wasn't a hundred percent. Get out, get out, get out. Get out, get out of my life. Get out, get out. Deborah, you want to be on the show? My wife is talking to me. She, okay, here, Dick. I couldn't hear everything right. I was saying. Uh, let me take a quick break, and you you take a quick break too. We'll meet back in a minute or two. Right. All right. All right. Oh, man. All right. So was um, your wife responding to what I was saying or she was talking about something else? Uh, well, give me the last part of what you were saying. I'm trying to remember. Um, it was Jesus' message. Okay. I was saying that we were talking about how some people probably haven't felt that love. And by me giving them that love, it could change way they believe and have you met physically any of the people that you just mentioned yes go into that one if you're okay with right. it. when i'm not sure what your question is clarify your question then I'll well you you mentioned you mentioned the uh one of the guys you mentioned was uh somebody who spoke before the about the January 6th event and then mm -hmm. uh, about how giving them love changed their life and yes. so you were um, giving examples of that and I just asked you if you if these people were people you gave love to from a distance or they happened you happen to work with them in a uh, therapeutic context or how did 
there are people that I have worked with that I have infused the love into the conversation. Things when they say to me, a blanket statement, all fill in the blank are, you know, baby killers or all these people are um, negative or they only want for a particular political party to be in charge and and they make blanket statements that may not be accurate. And so when they're condemning other people, I say things like, how would Jesus want us to love the people that you're judging? And then I let it go. And it plants a seed. And sometimes people will think about it and they'll just get quiet. And sometimes they'll go, I never thought of it that way. So you're saying that doing that changes them? It can. I'm not saying it does. But it has. It has done it for people you've met or thought of. People have. It's caused them to think about it. Yes. Whether it changed their behavior, I don't know. So how did you? How did you go from Jesus' message to the people? You mentioned several people that that their life changed uh, where they became a different person. How did you go from Jesus' message to that information? How, bridge, the, bridge the gap between those two. Well, the message from Jesus to the present's only been two months. So there hasn't been tremendous opportunity for me to infuse that into everyday life. Right. But that, that type of message that they gave me in my near death experience to love people till they can love themselves. I've been doing that for 40 years as a therapist. And I can say there are cases where people have turned around from I hate myself. I'm not anything. I'll never amount to anything to now where they are. They love themselves. They're living a healthier life. They're in a happy relationship. They're productive. Yeah, I understand all that. So, but how did you go from that? Even with that bridge, it doesn't quite get to you were the th you mentioned three particular people. What what was it? Why did you think of these three or I don't know? I guess it was three individuals. What 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 brought them them in particular up in your mind just now? Well, the Brown situation, the white supremacy. The pastor of the church had preached about that three weeks prior, so I was familiar with that. When I was preparing the sermon, I went to find evidence, examples of people who had been part of a group think who had changed their mind. And so oh, I okay. found an example there. And then in, I used an example of somebody that I had interacted with who was of that mindset, who said all, and this is this person's fault. And so, I infused that idea of love into that, of what would Jesus do in this situation? And it turned the conversation, the conversation stopped. So those are the only ones that I used in the sermon. Since then, when given the opportunity, I will infuse it into the conversation, but I don't go many places. I stay pretty much to myself. I don't go to crowds. So the people you mentioned were people you found through your research that that had happened to? Well, the the Brown person, yes. And the um, Stephen Ayers, yes. The one I'm, other person I mentioned in my sermon is somebody that I encountered that is a practitioner that I see. Oh, okay, so going back to the uh, experience you had with Jesus, what do you remember? Anything more about the actual experience itself that you haven't already mentioned other than you were in Reiki, you had your eyes closed, he was sitting next to you on a bench and his what he looked like. Is there anything about that experience that you haven't already said, you know, like uh, an energy or anything that was that you haven't already mentioned is, that was about that experience? Okay. I will relate it to what it's connected to prior to that experience. At another time that Reiki was being done on me, I was taken to the actual crucifixion. 
and I was able to be present. I was a bystander and I could see what was going on. I could. Do you think you time traveled to the actual event? I do. Okay, go ahead. So in that instance, I could hear, I could see, I could smell. I, I was just frozen in time and in emotion, just so overwhelmed that I was present and and I knew that I was here in this dimension, but I also knew that that was real, that I traveled to the real event. Right. So it was profound impact on me. I came back, I was shaking, I was crying. I, I could barely get the words out to say to the person who was doing the Reiki, this is what happened. And then, so when I met with him in this instance, sitting beside me, I traveled in time again to go where he was. It wasn't, it, it was time travel. So I, you're saying when you were on, when you were the second event, the second encounter with him, uh, you're sitting on the bench, but you think you went somewhere is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. So where do you think this bench was? I think it was in Jerusalem or wherever Bethlehem, um, somewhere over there. I don't know exactly. So you think it was somewhere in the Middle East? I do. And could you, besides him sitting next to you, could you, did you like feel the wind or the floor or something on I your could feet? Smell, um, like, not body odor, but human, like you would sitting next to somebody. And I could, I could smell like olive trees and I could feel like a breeze and a warmth. I could feel there was like sand under my feet. It was very real. Uh, okay, well, uh, any other uh, aliens or interesting creatures you've come across? None that's coming to mind right now. I might think of 10 later, but right now, no. <laughs> So if somebody uh, did an awful thing, they put a gun to your head and said, tell me all the aliens you've encountered, different types of aliens, or I'll kill you. What, how many, what number comes to your mind? Well, if I mention all the people that I know they're on the Council of Eight. Um, Are they all different? All different races? Yeah, they're different okay, races. So that's they're eight different all, races. They're not, you know, eight different kinds. They're there's like a praying mantis, um, Arturian, um, trying to think. I'd have to look it up because I don't keep that information in my head. But, but you're saying no, Kathleen, Mar not, Kathleen no. Martin's book has it in there? Yes. Which, tell, tell us which book that is of hers? Forbidden Knowledge. Okay, well, you just sold one of her books. <laughs> so uh, so there's those are eight different races, right? I don't know if it's eight, but they're different races. I'd have to look it up to see. Right, them. relatively speaking, it's a yeah. plus or minus. And then Robbie is another one that makes nine. And then your Arcturian that might be might be a tenth. It might be the same as one of the others, right? Well, it if he's the Arcturian, he was the one of the near death experience, the one in 1969, the one in November of 92, and so then. He, there's another experience that I had that we haven't talked about, if you want. Yeah, yeah, we, I want to hear everything. Don't okay. leave anything back. Okay. This would have been, I think it was at either the beginning of 92 or the end of 91. I was asleep and in this sleep state, it wasn't a dream. I was taken to the place, it's called the waiting place, the in-between place where people go when they die. Right. And as I am in this place, people are zombies. They don't know they're dead. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not a zombie. I know where I am. I know I'm here. Why am I here? And I hear a voice that says to me, come through. We are offering to you this, I guess it's invitation for you to make a spiritual leap you will go to a new dimension but if you choose to do this you can't ever go back you can't unopen the door and 
at the time in the experience, my husband of that marriage was there with me. And in the dream, he said, yeah, I'll go, I'll go. Well, I made the leap and he didn't. So when I come back in my body and I wake up, they had told me, don't discuss this. Don't mention it. I woke up, I was discombobulated. I, I was just, he said, what's wrong? Nothing. What's wrong? And part of the reason I'm not married to him is he was very critical, very demanding. And he pretty much forced it out of me. And he says to me, I would have made the leap with you. I would have made the leap. Well, I was changed. I was in a different place. I was different when I came back and I did make the leap but my spiritual growth was delayed for a number of years because I remained married to him. When I finally made the decision that it was, it was time for me to leave after 40 years of marriage, when I left, my spiritual growth was exponential after that. So what would have happened if you hadn't fessed up? Would he have beaten you or what, what would have happened? He might have. He, he might have... Um, his normal thing was to not talk to me, to avoid me, to make. It would have been a uh, silent treatment. Oh yeah, or to be very mean to me in public in front of people, to try to disgrace me in public. And I was a professional, so he'd say things about me in front of other people that my clients or people didn't need to hear, didn't need to know about me. Or we'd be in public and he'd say something about, tell him about the time you ran over a puppy and killed him. Okay. So, yeah. Um, let's not talk about him anymore. <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to dwell on the negative parts of our experience. So, um, I, the last one you asked you about more aliens, but you are more yeah creatures. What? And your answer was again. What? What did the? That somehow disconnected the question with the answer well there may have been more experiences i just don't remember them oh right. you mean you mean when you're on the other side and you went to the other dimension there could have been any number of experiences over there that's what you're referring to well that and since then you know, there, so, the the other time was november it was november of 1992 and the seven foot tall being came to me and I was in a hotel room in Washington, D.C. for Thanksgiving, meeting my son who was in seminary there in Washington, D.C. And the being said, it's time for you to set up a holistic clinic. And I said, no, it's not. I'm in a group practice. I'm happy with my group practice. I don't want to set up. And just like in 1969, he said, you will set it up. And he was gone. So well, which one was I, this? Which creature was this? This was a seven foot tall creature. The Arcturian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He said it's time. So I went to my group practice and I said, um, I guess I'm going to be setting up my own practice. And so as of February 2nd, 1993, I had my own practice, holistic practice with practitioners and other nutritionists, massage therapist, financial planner. Chiropractor. When you when you say holistic practice versus group practice, what's really the you know if you were answering this next question in front of a group of one first graders or third graders, how do you explain the difference between the two? When I talk to people, I do more than just talk. When I help them. I will do things if they're in my office that are appropriate, touch kinds of things, or I will do things using tools, um, magnets or a pendulum, and I'll show them what I'm doing if I was talking to a child that age. And that's different from regular just talk therapy. I do more than just talk. Right. But I mean, okay, so you're saying in a list in – that's what you do in group, right? Well, I do it with individual. I'm saying if you had me talking to a, a group of third graders, eight-year-olds, how would I explain it? I would take well, the tools. I, I, I was, 
I was wanting you to explain the difference between what you had and what they, the creature wanted you to have and why oh, you okay. elected to go from A to B. Oh, okay. It's A, to, you do A, what you do in A, and, and B, you do, it's what you do in B. So what I'm trying to get a contrast between these two different types of okay. scenarios. The group that I was a part of prior to setting up the holistic clinic was very Christian, pastoral, praying, scripture, um, using a chaplaincy model of how you do things, um, doing Erickson type things, looking at developmental issues. Well, when I went into doing the holistic practice, I might do things like um, a visualization and get them to imagine talking to their inner child, or I might get them to draw. But, I, but, but why were you reluctant to go from when the creature told you to go from one to the next? Why were you reluctant? I know I know you you thought you, what you're doing was the proper path, but why did you think that what he wanted you to do would be less proper? Well, I mean, what was your why? Where did your reluctance come from? My reluctance was one: it took a lot of money to set up your own practice. You had to have licenses, business licenses. You had to have money for um, deposits on places. So you were part of somebody else's practice? Yes, I was. Oh, there you, there I understand. I understand now. You, yeah. you were part of somebody else's practice. Right, and which was fine. You, I didn't have the overhead. I didn't have the headaches. I just went to the office. He wanted you to to step out and take on the whole big shebang. All, and was there was there some uh, heartache and uh, financial heartache maybe or whatever when you did that? Did it all flow? straight into <laughs> the setup was smooth and nice but then because i didn't obey when i made the spiritual leap then something happened to divert the path and if you want me to get into that i will but sure that's a whole nother path that's fine okay i had a couple that came to see me one of the couple didn't want to be there didn't want help just came to say he didn't want help. The requirement was if somebody came to become a client, you had to sign paperwork that made you a client. Right. The woman signed the paperwork, the husband did not. He says to me, I wanna to talk to the therapist by myself to tell her something. And I asked the wife that, okay, yes. He came in, he told me something. He said, I'm done. He walks out in the reception room. He says to the wife, she'll tell you what I said. Well, there wasn't anything that he said that he didn't say in front of her. So there was nothing to tell. So when the time came for them to get divorced, I was ordered to write a treatment summary. Well, how do you write a treatment summary that doesn't include what happened? So I said, you know, a couple came in, didn't want to, well, his attorney said that I violated his confidentiality because he was a client. Even though he didn't want to sign the paperwork, he was a client. So... I was ordered to um, be on probation. I had to take a graduate level ethics course. Seriously? I lost um, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of money from clients because nobody would refer to me. Colleagues would not associate with me because they didn't want to be painted with the same brush. So as a result of all that. Oh, you're saying, hold on, stop for a second. So you're saying that because of his disgrunt, being disgruntled with your practice, what happened, he caused you a lot of pain. I'm, I'm not saying the seven foot being did this. I'm saying because I didn't follow through what they told me to do. It was the consequences of my own actions. Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not blaming the being. I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, you had a couple and the cup, the man, Got disgruntled with your practice, and he, through his the man didn't. It was his attorney who did. The man could have cared less. Seriously. So the attorney of the client caused you pain, and the client didn't really care one way or the other. Exactly. Didn't the client like you or something? He the didn't client? have any. He had no 
investment in it whatsoever. Did not care if the attorney caused you pain. And the attorney so, attorney did cause you pain. Yeah. It was yeah. all it was all public. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. So as a result, I took the ethics course and I decided I would go ahead and get my doctorate in case I lost my license, then I could still have my doctorate and do counseling as a pastoral counselor under that heading. So I went ahead and got my doctorate and then in the meantime. How long did that take? Five and a half years. In addition to your, what, what degree did you already have? I already had a master's and a BA. So you, took, you had a master's and a bachelor's and you spent another five years learning just so you could stay in practice. Yeah. Wow, that's some pain. Now that attorney did cause you some pain. <laughs> Lots of money. Lots of money. So as a result, um, my spouse at the time decided he was going to leave town. He didn't want to be there anymore. We'd been there 23 years and he was done and he didn't care if I went with him or not. Well, because I, I wasn't getting clients and I didn't have anything to do, I decided I will go ahead and complete my getting ordained. I was already a pastor for 23 years at that point or more. Um, and so I would go ahead through the process to get ordained so I could serve a church in case I couldn't do my practice. So I went ahead and did that and I became ordained. It was September 19th, 1997. And so we moved to Charleston, South Carolina. And oh, I oh stop, stop for a second. So did you get ordained before you got your 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 um, what was the five year doctorate yeah doctorate before. did you get your did you get ordained before you got your doctorate yes okay go ahead yeah so got ordained moved to charleston and by then after i'd moved to charleston we moved to charleston at the end of 99 and by that time i found out that i'd completed the ethics course and the only thing was a private reprimand but I sued my licensure board because during the process of all this going on, they, without my knowledge, or without my consent, notified insurance companies that I had this complaint against me. So that meant insurance companies weren't going to refer to me. And authorizations that they had for clients I had been seeing for years, they rescinded the authorizations. So it meant these people who had stability and trust in me weren't able to see me. So it was horrible. So I sued them. And we mediated at the end for me to have my say in court and for them to have their say. And so we settled in mediation. I hope you got a decent amount of money out of that. No. You didn't? No. So why did you settle at all without? Because the longer the mediation went on, the less money you were getting. So you're saying without a settlement, you couldn't get clients? Oh, I could then see clients, but without some kind of validation that I was right, they shouldn't have done this. They shouldn't have reported it without my knowledge. And I just wanted to make the point. I couldn't get back. So you sued them just to just to just to, to to change the pattern of what they did to people. Yeah, there was no way I could get it back. It was gone. Well, so you didn't hurt them financially. You just made a strong point of it and yeah. to change their how they were treating people yeah let's uh hope it didn't cost you too much to sue them because it, it seemed did. like it did. it did so you may you spent a lot of money to make a point well that's that's big that's very big of you because that's you know it was the right thing to do yeah well let's hope it actually changed their ways because i mean if you're spending a lot of money to make people change their ways, you don't, you know, you're not following them, watching their back. You don't know if they actually changed or not. But I hope that was uh, very magnanimous of you to do that. Thank you. Um, so, um, are there? I have all the time in the world. I don't know what what you have pressing for this evening, but what? Uh, what else what other experiences have you had that are that are uh, that you feel the listener would be uh, fascinated with because uh, you know i as long as this conversation is interesting i'm willing to go as long as you want to go 
Okay. As long as you can keep it interesting, we're, 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 we, can, we can take this as long as you have the time. So I have no pressing. Okay. My belief is that I'm here as a willing person to bring forth whatever I am to facilitate, whoever am I am supposed to help, that they are the gift, whatever's presented to me. I'm not to judge it, I'm just to, okay, here it is. Decide best how I can perform what I feel led to do. And then I move forward with it. And if I feel that it's not right, I will get a response in my gut. It will be my bladder that screams at me and says, no, no, no. And then I'll go, oh, okay. Then I'm not supposed to say that or I'm not supposed to do that. So I did that. I meditated on should I do this interview with you or not? Is it going to serve good or is it going to be negative for somebody? And if it is, then I don't want to do it. Right. The answer, the answer I got was, yeah, go ahead. So I did. Good. That's a very interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm glad to hear that somebody will benefit from this interview. That's not just being done just for my ego. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I do not want. If it's if it's all about me, no. It's the messages that I've been asked to bring that is important, and that I will do. So do you have any other experiences you want to speak about that you think would, um, you know, um, people want to know, they want to be entertained, but they also want um, understanding and, and knowledge. Your, your, your experience with Christ was obviously... Um, a valuable piece of information and the the fact that um, you and the how many other people have the connection with the eight council of eight that you mentioned there there are four of us four of us yeah the, the fact that all four of those people and you name them have the connection with the council of eight kind of validates the council of eight because you know i or anybody else could go and ask any of those people do you have a connection with the council of eight and if they say yes, you know, and then that's another story that's going to put in a, you know, it's like building a wall, you know, each brick builds a piece of the of the wall. And uh, hopefully you're building a good wall for a good reason. Well, yeah. I would recommend that after you read the book Forbidden Knowledge, you might want to interview the rest of the council to see how our answers coincide. You mean the, the other th three? Four. The other three, uh, yeah. The other three people, which give their names again, Kathleen Martin. Kathleen Martin, Denise Stoner, Denise and Kevin Stoner. Briggs. You'll, their names are in the book. Yeah, well, I I uh, I don't know if Kathleen would interview with me because we have we have our we have a we have some background. Okay. I I wanted to uh, do hypnotherapy regressions with uh, with MUFON people and I asked um, what's his face uh, give me the name of the last not the current but the last MUFON leader um, you know of him starts with a J um, Jan Harzan yeah okay so I talked to him he said yes I can do it he just gave me the you know yes you you can do it he told me I could work with MUFON uh, experiencers and regress them to help them out. And then after he did that, he kind of turned it over to Kathleen as his head investigator and said, you know, basically he's wanting her to to say yes or no to kind of second guess his yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't just a blanket yes. I mean, it was, but then it became a if she says yes, then it's a yes. That's what it turned into, right? And so she, we got into a conversation about um, the man who uh, regressed, or the hypnotist who regressed, Kathleen, uh, Betty and Barney Hill, mm -hmm. her, her, her uh, aunt, and her aunt. And, uh, you know, I, I've never had a very high value with his 
what he did. I didn't think what he did was very was the right thing. I don't think his technique his during the session with uh, Barney in particular. I don't really think he did. He didn't do what I would have done, and and so I didn't really have. A, I still to this day don't have a real high uh, opinion of his of his practice. I'm not saying he wasn't talented or capable. He just, I just know, being somebody who's a competent regressionist, I know that he could have done a better job. And so, I I said that in very, um, very direct terms to Kathleen when I'm talking with her, and I don't think she appreciated that. But then she passed. Instead of saying yes, you can do what Jan says. You can have a yes. Uh, c can do you know instead of validating he that yes with another yes she then passed it on to her head researcher and i don't know i can't remember his name off the top of my head you might remember it but it's the guy who who's just below her in the research uh hierarchy within mufon and um uh, i don't know his title but he uh interviewed me and he said no and i said i asked them in general her and him i said why i'm very talented as a as a regressionist i don't have any doubt that i can do the job um satisfactorily for the clients and uh why do you say no and well they the answer their answer was that i need to go I need to have more of a um, like. Let's say you uh, were a mental health pr practitioner and you had a PhD or an MD or whatever, uh, any kind of validation within that field. They wanted me to have that in addition to the talent and abilities as a hypnotherapist. I've worked with one abductee. Uh, was used as a breeder. She was one of my clients. And uh, I, I had charged her for like a couple of regular sessions that had nothing to do with uh, hypnotherapy, nothing to do with uh, aliens. I, I charged her my regular fee. But then when I realized after the second session that she was a, an a experiencer, I started going down that road and I didn't charge her anything. But she had, she paid me my full rate for one session, even though I didn't ask her for any money, because she experienced because she benefited from the session so much, she felt obligated to pay me, even though I wasn't asking for any money. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of so I know from my experience, not just from my ego, that I could work with experiencers and they would benefit even more than just me getting that information. OK, just from pure therapy, mm -hmm. uh, pure therapeutic perspective. And so I knew that I could do the job without any doubt, without having this extra training. And I, I'm not prepared to go and get certified as a, uh, a uh, drug counselor or any other type of therapy to validate my talent as a hypnotherapist. I mean, I just feel very confident that I can do the job without that. So I didn't feel like, why should I go do that? I mean, it is some, a path I could go. It's like when I was living in Houston, Texas, I was in the movie industry. And I knew I knew a lady who was the most powerful agent, uh, SAG, uh, Screen Actor Guild related agent in the whole city. And I knew that I could go find a good actor or actress, find a script, put those together, and make a scene and videotape it and then take that to her and she could give me the the acting career that I was one of the you know one of the, my goals I knew I could do that but I just didn't chose to go down that path that's my bad that was my fault that I didn't you know I could be a famous very rich actor right now if I wanted to I'm not talented as an actor but it wasn't a path that I chose and it's the same with MUFON you know, I could go and get certified as a drug counselor or whatever to 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 satisfy their requirement.
but I, I really don't think they give that requirement to most of their regressionists. I don't think they go. I know a, a gentleman here in in uh, Georgia, an older gentleman, older than me, and he does a lot of the regressions here. I don't think he's got any certifications like that. And so I don't think they're giving that requirement to just anybody. And I'm not sure why they gave it to me. And, you know. How, how did you learn to do what works for you? You mean how to be a good hypnotherapist? I learned it from a teacher. Uh, when I was in Houston, I used to go to New Age type uh, events in this one house, in this one location. And this guy was giving free, uh, you know, uh, a free talk about hypnotherapy. And he sucked me into to learning from him. He doesn't, I actually looked in Google Street and tried to find his house to where he used to live. I looked up his address, you know, I kind of researched it and found where he used to live. There's no house or anything on that lot. It's like, I have no evidence this guy ever existed other than all my certs. You know, I've got all these certificates that are printed out and everything and signatures on them and all that. I have a lot of validation that he existed, but physically, you know, he moved up to from from Conroe up to uh, up north somewhere. And I have no proof that he ever physically existed in Houston. You know, his house, his lot, it's like, it's like there was never a house on that lot. It's like a bar totally barren lot. And uh, it's really odd. But anyway, he was very good. Uh, I watched him regress two different people simultaneously at the same time. They're sitting next to each other. There's a lady and a woman. And he regressed both of them at the same time. And and then his wife took over for one of them and he worked on the other. And it was fascinating. The whole the whole class we had was fascinating. And uh, and you know, I learned a lot from him and, and uh, I've learned other things from other teachers since then, but nothing nothing as much as he taught me. And part of my deal during that uh, during his, to get certified underneath him, it wasn't just you had to go to his eight, seven or eight classes or seven or eight weekends, you know, two, two days per weekend, it's like 14 days. It wasn't just that, you also had to, uh, in a real world setting with real clients, you had to work with like X number of hours to uh, with real people who were not just in that class, to get the certification, and so I went to a, a, um, I went to a, uh, the only federally funded day hospital in the city of Houston, and worked with their people for a period, and um, that was interesting too. I don't want to go into it too deeply because it's just very time consuming, but uh, there was a uh, somebody with a PhD at the head of that school that that I worked underneath that degree uh, to be able to do therapy, you know, officially, you know, not not just as a private, as a private practice. Any, as far as I know, anywhere outside the state of California, you do not have to be certified by the state or anybody. And so the California, uh, I forgot the guy's name, but there was a um, Gil Boyne, I think, uh, got California to have a, a certification for hypnotists to where you have to be certified by the state to do hypnosis in that state. Now in Texas, where I'm from, when I was living there, there was a guy who um, who went to the uh, a, a senator or somebody. He got this congressman, state congressman, to pass a law that outlawed the state, the, the practice of hypnotherapy for everybody. I mean, totally outlawed it. The only, the way he did it was he conned the guy into believing that uh, you really need all those extra training to do it properly. And so the law, as it's passed, and it's as far as I know, it's still a law today in the state of Texas, you cannot hypnotize somebody and regress them and, and work with them as a therapist unless you're a lawyer 
an MD, a, uh, a drug counselor, or a licensed professional counselor. If you're not uh, one of those four, you know, you're, they couldn't, couldn't uh, stop the lawyers because those guys do regressions all the time. And you're not going to tell a whole bunch of lawyers you can't do regressions. So he couldn't cut them out of the deal. So yeah, you you, you got to be a lawyer. You got an MD. He's not going to cut the MDs out. That, that's like a ma mafia there. MDs, you, you, they, they're going to, you know, you couldn't pass. There's no way you're going to pass a law in any state that cuts out the MDs of doing anything they're doing. That's just not going to fly. So you got lawyers, MDs, licensed professional counselors, and licensed drug counselors. If you're not one of those four in the state of Texas, you cannot do regression hypnosis uh, right now legally. Now, the fact is that it still goes on. The, nobody, as far as I know, has ever diminished the practice of hypnotherapy in the state of Texas, ever. And I don't know if anybody has ever been taken to court because they're not one of those four categories. So I'd really like to to get details if anybody ever gets sued taken to court by any any authority of the state uh, that are not one of those four because they've regressed somebody through hypnosis I want to I want to hear that court that that everything about that I want I want to get into that one because you've got a whole practice of people hundreds if not thousands of people in the state of Texas who are doing uh, regressions who are all having to do it illegally. That makes no sense because the most talented people in the world in, in as far as hypnotherapy goes are hypnotists. They're not any of these other professions. They've never taken the extra certs or become a licensed professional counselor, or licensed drug counselor. They're not lawyers and they're not doctors. And they're having to do their practice illegally which makes no sense whatsoever. So I called this guy, I called this congressman, state congressman, I told him, you're, you're, I, I, I won't even repeat what I said to them, said to him on this, this conversation, but I guarantee you, he did not like what I said to him. It was very straightforward and not very positive. And I, I basically told him, you know, you're, you, you are unscrupulous. It's, I may have even said that word, you know, you're un, you're an unscrupulous person to pass this law, and uh, and you know he he did he he was very unhappy when we got through talking, but uh, you know I I just don't think I think the most talented hypnotists in the world, hypnotists on earth today and going back ages, are people who've never had any of those extra certifications or degrees. So that's how I feel about hypnotherapy. Okay. The talented ones. I'm not talking about the, uh, see, you've got all that extra stuff, but I think there's a whole boatload of people who don't have any of that stuff that are just as talented, if not more talented than you, mm -hmm. in the state of Texas and in every state and every country. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying positive things won't come out of his legislation. Maybe he protected somebody some way, somehow, or somebody got to sue somebody at some point, maybe there's some positive thing that came out of that, that that I'm not aware of, but I just think he's really damaged the the um, the the practice of hypnos hypnotherapy in that state by passing that law. That's just my opinion. So anyway, because of that's where Kathleen and her sidekick. Uh, who I cannot remember his name off the top of my head. He's not a famous person, but you go look look up MUFON uh, researchers, you know, who's, who's the head? She's the head of research, and he's the whatever you call the guy right under her. Okay. And uh, he's the one that really said no, and she just kind of concurred with him uh, about that. And I think I would have had they all said yes and it all moved forward, I think I would have helped a lot of people just like you have uh, done. And I think it's kind of a sad thing that that path didn't get, didn't get opened up because, you know, I, even when I'm working with somebody who's a, 
abductee contact experience or my number one thought of mine is not to get information from that person but to leave them in a state after the, the session's over where they're in a infinitely more positive state of mind and being than when i started yeah. so i you know even though i may get all kinds of information from them for mufon i'm my primary role is not to get that information my primary role is to benefit the client and so uh, the the research to me is a secondary thing. And if they don't come out of that, you know, if I did what what the, the fellow did with Barney, you know, if I was Barney, I would have kind of like, I might have sued the guy because, you know, you he what happened was he got Barney in the state where he was in the presence of the aliens and Barney freaked. Have you heard the you've heard the audio? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Now, he could have walked over, he could have said to Barney, I'm going to walk over and touch your shoulder or some part of your body. And the second I touch you, all of your fear is going to go away. You, you will, you're still in that space, but you're also in this space, and the aliens are not going to hurt you, and all your fear is going out, but you're, all your, the rest of the experience is still open to, to you giving that out but your fear is going to be gone the second I touch you. He walked over and touched his shoulder. Boom, his fear is gone. He is no longer in a state of fear. And he could have continued. The guy could have done that easily, but he didn't do it. And somebody he else... also broke confidentiality by revealing what was supposed to be kept secret. Well, tell me. Well, I don't want to get into all that because I don't have all the correct details, but the psychiatrist... <clears throat> leak the information about Barney and Betty. He's the one that made it public. I believe so. Wow, I didn't know that. I think he he sold it like to the newspaper or something. Go read, go look at it, because I don't want to look at what. Go look at what. Go look at who leaked the information about Benny and Barney Hill, the the psychiatrist tapes. Who leaked them? Because they were not to be made public. Oh, so he he didn't leak the fact that they were abductees. He le leaked the actual uh, tapes. I believe so. Go look it up. Don't take my word for it. Well, even if you're wrong, it's not like you've committed some big sin or something. Everybody can make mistakes. I just I don't like to say stuff I'm not really up on and and have it people hear it and go, oh, she said this. Well, I'm saying I don't know that that's accurate. So go check it out. Okay, sure. So do you know that, so you know that uh, Kathleen Martin is also an abductee, right? Yes. Okay, so do you know, uh, what do you know about her experience? Is that is that something That's, you're okay to talk with, talk no, about? No, she can talk about it. I won't. I've had that agreement with her. That's her story to tell. That's about. fine. I, I, I just remember one of her talks. She said that she remembered the craft landing across the street from their house. That's right. And so I made, an, I made a giant leap with that information that she's also, was also taking, because generally they don't take, well, they could easily take one person and leave the rest and never take them, but that's just not typically done, uh, is my knowledge, you know, I could be wrong. Well, if, if she agrees to do an interview with you, you can ask her those questions or you can read her book about it. Well, I'd rather interview her because it's far more. In well, well read, on. read the book Forbidden Knowledge and then you'll have a lot of questions answered. Really? I might, you know, I got four books I'm reading now. It's going to be a while. And right. It's going to be a while before I can fit it in. I don't want to have a fifth book. I'm reading four at a time is enough. It's more than enough. <laughs> So is we're uh, at the two, two hour and 43 minute mark and I'm willing to go as long as you are. How, how do you feel about uh, going? Are you tired? Do you want to well, end it? I need, my blood sugar is going down, so I need to wrap it up. And do you need a candy bar? <laughs> I have a protein bar, but that's not sufficient. So I what do you have to do? Um, I need to call it a day for this time, and if you want to talk another time, fine. But that's fine. That's perfectly fine with me. It's it's your it's your need and your desire, and 
I'm perfectly fine with whatever is your need and your desire. So I absolutely very much appreciate you coming on my show. I I had no idea you would be anywhere near as interesting of an interview as you. I mean, you know, I, seriously, I thought you'd be interesting, but not nearly as much as you have been. Thank you. It, it was a pleasure. And I, th I consider this to be one of my top interviews, but just because of all the extremely interesting areas we've gotten into. Uh, I wish you the absolute best in your practice. If you talk to Denise or Kathleen or uh, or what was the other guy's name? Uh, Kevin Briggs. Yeah, if you talk to any of those people, tell them Mike wants to interview you. <laughs> I will tell them and you'll have to let me know when this airs where people can find it so I can promote it. It'll be on YouTube. It'll probably be up within an hour of our interview. Okay. And I will, I've got your email address, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So send me the link and then I'll put it on my social media. All right. And I'm, I, do you mind, you don't mind if I tweet it, do you? No. So no. if I, I send you lots of new customers, you'll be okay with it, right? Absolutely. Yes. And I <laughs> appreciate it. Yes. But I won't tell you that they came, not without a signed release. No, no. Why would I care about any of the questions? I'm just, I'm just going off of what had happened to me, so I get something happened anything with anything that I do. Some something happened. I hear, I hear you had some pain for some reason. No, I, I would never ask you about any of your clients unless they told me they came to you first before you mentioned it. You, you never mentioned who your clients are unless, unless somebody know unless that. The client actually divulges that to the public. Even if the client divulges it, really, I can't say anything about it unless they sign a release. Oh, you mean details? Yeah, of course. Or even you can't even say they came to you, can you? That's right. Really, I wasn't aware of that. I figured if they said they came to you, then I would think you'd be able to concur with what they've already stated. No, what I would say is, okay, they can tell you that, but I can't. I would I, w I ne would never thought of it quite like that, but I guess that's it. Well, that's the complaint that was made against me that we talked about. They're saying that I gave the information that he came and I didn't have his written permission to say that. Well, one of these days, if we ever have another interview, we're going to have to get into that because I don't really quite understand how um, how he could be upset unless it unless it came into his marriage divorce settlement where his wife is saying well she did x so therefore i want y you know if he it was the attorney it was an attorney yeah court. yeah i i got that but I, I don't even understand why an attorney would go after you other than you know maybe they'd make some money by suing you i, I can understand that you think that maybe was the motivation? Well, the attorney wouldn't have made money off of it because he wasn't getting anything out of it financially from me. It wasn't the attorney suing me. It was the client by the attorney's prompting that was making the complaint. The client wasn't even suing me. The client didn't do anything. It's just so, he made the complaint to the licensure board. It's the licensure board that had the hearing. Oh, so you're saying the attorney had a grievance in that moment he egged the client on the client went to the licensure board because the attorney egged the client on i'm not even sure that the the mail went to the the licensure board i think the attorney probably did oh okay so well it sounds like you had a lot of pain for no good reason well it was good in the outcome it taught me how to be more protective of the clients it taught me how to be very certain about what I was doing. And if I didn't feel right working with a client or if they wouldn't sign the paperwork, I wouldn't go to step two. Well, it sounds like you got more legalistic rather than, I mean. You had to in order to survive in this arena. In this so arena. do you think it actually helped you the way you interact? Yes, it helped me to structure more so that anything I write, anything I do, I'm always thinking who's looking over my shoulder. If I have to answer for this, how am I going to document what I'm doing? How am I going to justify what I'm doing? Well, let me go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you very much for being on the show. 
I wish you the best in your practice. I will put links if you have links to X, Y and Z thing that you have. Just send them, send me an email. I'll add them to the notes below you, the link. I'll send you the link as soon as I have it up, which should be very shortly. And uh, let me go ahead and close this, stop this recording before I kick the wrong button.